they're just different um, types of We've got a green light. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Welcome everyone to the September 10th San Rosa City Council meeting. Can we have an announcement of the roll call, please? Let the record show that all council members are present. Thank you. Uh, we had no study session or closed session, but we do have a couple of proclamations. Uh, we'll start with uh, Ms. Fleming. I think you have our first one for Creek Pollution Prevention Week. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can somebody do me a favor and find out who we're supposed to call down while I'm getting out my agenda? Um, the recipients of this would Katie Robinson come forward, please. Hi, sorry about that. We just okay. got in. Whereas throughout the United States, the week starting on the third Monday of September is recognized as National Pollution Prevention Week, and whereas throughout much of California, including the Russian River watershed, cities, counties, and other stewardship organizations are recognized in the fourth week of September as Creek Week, and whereas our pollution prevention practices are intrinsically linked to the health of our watershed, lands, and waterways, and whereas the City of Santa Rosa supports programs to reduce pollution, increase environmental quality of our watershed, and provide our communities with the knowledge to be effective stewards of the Russian River watershed, lands, and waterways, and whereas the nearly 1,500 square miles of lands, 238 creeks, and approximately 350,000 residents of the Russian River watershed are connected and mutually support each other in making the Russian River, along with its tributaries and associated features, important resources to the people of Sonoma and Mendocino counties. And whereas pollution in the form of trash, debris, chemicals from industry and everyday living, and sediment from construction and many land uses and activities all have the potential to degrade the quality of life and the quality of resources within the Russian River watershed, and whereas the City of Santa Rosa, through our stormwater management program, strives to protect the lands and waterways through ongoing pollution prevention outreach, which aims to raise awareness of the harmful effects of pollutants to our natural systems. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Tom Schwedhelm, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, do hereby proclaim that September 16th to the 22nd of 2019 is Pollution Prevention Week, and September 21st to 28th, 2019 is Creek Week in the City of Santa Rosa, and ask all members of our community to support efforts to protect and enrich watershed health by participating in the many Pollution Prevention Week and Creek Week activities, and to take active steps to reduce pollution and care for our environment throughout the year. Would you Thank like you, to make Mayor. some comments? Thank I'm, you. I'm not the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So we have several events planned this year for Creek Week. We're going to be kicking the week off with a creek cleanup at the Prince Memorial Greenway on Saturday, September 21st. On Monday the 23rd, we're going to be, going to be conducting a tour of the underground culvert here under downtown. Um, on Thursday the 26th, we're going to be doing a nature walk along Roseland Creek. And we're going to be ending the week 
on Saturday the 28th with a tour of the Laguna treatment plant. I've um, provided flyers back at the um, table next to the door and you guys should all have one in your packets. So thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. I do have one card on this item, uh, Nicole Warwick. Are you, yeah, if you go one of that, one of the two up there. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank the Santa Rosa City Council for prioritizing our health through this prevention, pollution prevention week. And also in regards to the uh, proclamation for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, it seems to me that these two proclamations are interrelated because what we're doing on the land and the water is impacting the health of our children. My name is Nicole Warwick. I'm the founding executive director of Families Advocating for Chemical and Toxic Safety. We know that childhood cancer is the number one killer of children in our nation and yet we continue to do very unhealthy practices in our communities. I would like to acknowledge and thank again this council back in 2018, you unanimously decided to restrict the use of all synthetic pesticides in public spaces. It has come to my attention that this is up for reconsideration, that you are considering contracting again with another agency that will again be polluting our environment with synthetic pesticides and herbicides that are quite caustic and dangerous to our children's health. I would like to point out the incongruence here, that we can't just in name say that we support pollution prevention and that we acknowledge childhood cancer and then continue with these practices that are indeed damaging our children. So I would like to remind you that these proclamations that we're making are not just proclamations in name, but they are the guiding compass that guides the work that we do and helps us prioritize the health of our children. To this effect, I would also like to point out that it is indeed a bit more costly to do it right. However, in the long run, it is more cost efficient for us to have healthy communities and healthy children who are attending all of our schools and enjoying the resources available to us in the city. And because of that, I would like to urge you to continue the ban that you have against synthetic pesticide use in public spaces. Thank you. Thank you. All right, 7.2, and Mr. Oliveros, I believe you have that. Uh, Mr. Ronnie Duvall, you wanna come forward? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'll read the proclamation. Whereas September is National Childhood Cancer, Cancer Awareness Month, a time to honor and remember the tens of thousands of children whose young lives were taken too soon, as well as raising awareness to the multitude of children and their families currently battling childhood cancer who need better treatments and our unconditional support. And whereas cancer is the leading cause of death by disease among U.S. children and is detected in more than 300,000 of our sons and daughters worldwide every year. Whereas the epidemic of childhood cancer is spreading with one out of every 200 and 85 children diagnosed by the time they reach the age of 20, and whereas two-thirds of childhood cancer patients will suffer lifelong chronic conditions caused by their treatments, and only four cancer treatments or drugs have been developed and approved for children fighting cancer over the last 20 years. And whereas one out of eight children diagnosed with cancer will not, sur will not survive their battle with this horrible disease. And whereas innovative studies are leading to real breakthroughs reminding us of the importance of supporting scientific research and discovery, moving us closer to better treatments and a cure for childhood cancer. And whereas gold is the official color to raise awareness, especially as we extend our condolences to the families whose children, of those children who have perished, and our support to all those children who continue to battle childhood cancer with incredible strength and courage. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Tom Schwedhel, Mayor of the City of San Rosa, on behalf of the entire City Council, does proclaim September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month.
I'd like to say thank you to everybody that uh, helped pass this proclamation for Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. It's very important that we do this and continue to strive in the right direction to preventing our future intoxications and exposures to the harsh chemicals as that gal had mentioned. Uh, I took a tour in 2016 around the entire United States and most all cancer clusters that I came across were centered around some form of industrial pollutions, agricultural pollutions, or some type of an air pollution. Uh, the amount of funding that the federal government is only offering the research programs for childhood cancer is only 3.8 is only 3.8 percent, and uh, so that's that's research that's necessary to solve these types of diseases. Um, the other hard part about that is the fact that not only are we underfunded for research, but how much longer do we have to research before we start looking at the causes and preventing our exposures and stopping the growing numbers annually of childhood cancer diagnosis? So on behalf of all that information, thank you guys for doing this. Thank you, Ronnie. We have a couple cards on this item. Uh, first up, Matt Calloway, followed by Megan Kahn. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Senator and City Council, for recognizing this uh, vitally important uh, plight of childhood cancer that uh, is so very serious. And I think it's a really great time to bring awareness to uh, some of the substances in our environment that are known to cause uh, cancers and the carcinogens that children can encounter when they're in uh, parks and schools. Um, Santa Rosa last year um, voted to end the use of uh, glyphosate and other synthetic pesticides when uh, with their current um, landscaping contractor and I have uh, heard that you guys are thinking about changing the contractor to somebody else, and I want to iterate that it's vitally important that you make the same commitment when you're uh, deciding for your the new what products your new contractor is going to be using, and also probably more importantly, um, putting a actual ban into place for not just uh, glyphosate but the whole range of synthetic pesticides that can um, that are known to be carcinogens. Um, do as Windsor and Sonoma County uh, has done and make a real commitment to preventing uh, toxic exposure in, with, uh, in, the, in the population that's um, most susceptible to that exposure, our children. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Megan Kahn followed by Ann Seeley. Mayor Schwendel, my members of the board, um, thank you again for bringing this uh, proclamation. It's really important to raise awareness on childhood cancer. Um, again, my name is Megan Cowan. I'm with Sonoma County Conservation Action, um, and I've been working for the past four years to try to get synthetic pesticides out of public spaces. Um, and this followed me noticing that Roundup was being used next to the playground at the Santa Rosa Park in our neighborhood. Um, since then, um, we have helped cities like Santa Rosa Institute full bans on synthetic pesticides um, that could harm children, um, both by causing cancer and other serious chronic health effects. Um, and I was really happy to see Santa Rosa make the full uh, pesticide ban last year. Um, as others have said, I would urge council to keep your full ban on synthetic weed killers in parks um, as it is now. Uh, a Roundup ban is really not good enough. Glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is harmful, but so is glufosinate, which is often what is substituted out for that chemical. Um, the other dozen other synthetic pesticides that are often um, so, that are often used by cities and uh, told that, and they are billed as being safe are really not safe for human health or the environment um, they may have less um, acute effects so if they get on your skin maybe they won't produce a burn um, but over the long term they are the ones that are associated with the chronic health effects like cancer um, in a healthy environment, 
childhood cancer should almost never happen. Um, and I realize that this is maybe a small drop in the bucket, but it is something that you, Santa Rosa City Council, can do to help reduce a child's exposure to the toxins that do lead to cancer and other chronic illnesses. So I thank you again for your commitment to public health, and I really urge you to keep that commitment going in the future with your new landscape contract. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ann Seeley. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm and council members. I am a board member of Cons Cons Sonoma County Conservation Action, and I am most proud of the campaign that Megan just spoke to you about called the Toxic Free Futures Campaign. She has had shown incredible energy in meeting with municipalities and getting support to reduce the use of dangerous chemicals in our public spaces. We parents can make our own individual choices about what we use in our own yards and where we take our children but, and grandchildren. But if it's, if it's present in schools and parks and meeting spaces, can't childhood cancers will continue. So please do keep up with your efforts and support your local cities and the county. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. <clears throat> All right, Mr. McGlynn, uh, do we have a fire recovery and rebuild update? No update this evening. Thank you. Uh, sticking with our city manager, do you have a report for us this evening? Yes, a brief report. On Sunday, September 1st, a large branch off of the historic oak tree in front of the Finley Community Center broke off, landing in the landscape area. Once alerted, the parks crew cordoned off the area to protect the tree and the public. An arborist evaluated the tree's short-term and long-term health and concluded that actions can be taken to save the tree through tr trimming le limb lengths and height by as much as one-third and redistributing reshaping to redistribute the weights. An arborist will reevaluate the tree's condition next year to determine if any additional work is required. Thank you for that. Madam City Attorney, any report? I, I have nothing to report this afternoon. Okay, Council, any statements of abstentia? Mr. Tibbs? Thank you, Mayor. I will be abstaining from item 13.4 on the consent calendar and item 15.2 uh, relating to the Community Benefit District. Uh, organization I work for, St. Vincent Paul, owns a property in that district. Okay, thank you. Any others? Seeing none, great. Uh, mayor's council members' reports. Who would like to start? Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, highlights for the council, uh, starting with yesterday's Sonoma County Transportation Authority and Regional Climate Protection Agency meeting. Uh, first and foremost, the RCPA did advance uh, by unanimous vote the emergency climate declaration. Uh, it's something that we have uh, been discussing. Uh, I'm out of time. Yeah. <laughs> it is something that we discussed at our uh, Climate Action Subcommittee meeting last Thursday, and ultimately the direction uh, from the, the entity locally was to review what RCPA was doing and see if there was a way for us to get our perspective and language interjected into what ended up being adopted as the countywide declaration so that everybody would be relatively on the same, uh, on the same footing. Uh, we did end up being able to do that. The climate emergency resolution coming out of RCPA calls for uh, municipalities to reach climate, uh, excuse me, carbon neutrality where we take efforts around reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions, but then also take steps on carbon sequestration so that we can find that middle point uh, a little bit faster. That'll be coming back before the council as well. Uh, in that meeting, we also had an update from SCTA on the regional housing needs assessment process that is coming up. Uh, it is, uh, ARENA numbers are typically handed down to an entity around how much housing they need to build. Uh, we had one presenter who said that uh, she has gone through four arena cycles. This one will be her fifth and will be by far the most uh, 
awful, I think was the word that she used to describe it. Uh, some of the jurisdictions are starting to see with the new methodology that the amount of housing that they have in their arena numbers is substantially higher. 50% uh, increase for most. LA actually had a 300% increase in what their arena number was when they started to use the new methodology. So that's something for us to begin to plan for. There's also potential in conversation around SCTA playing a role in what's called sub-regionality, where we will have our total number as a county of housing units, and then that sub-region will actually be able to determine where those units go. So for places like Sonoma County that have been more focused on city center growth, there is likely going to be a fight at that entity if they move forward around shifting housing allocation from county jurisdiction into the individual cities. Uh, and I will remind folks that there are three supervisors that sit on SCTA, so that will be quite the fight. Uh, happy to keep you all posted. Uh, as we move forward, particularly as we finish crafting the Measure M reauthorization, uh, but that's been the, the highlight from the last, uh, the last month. Sure, Ms. Combs, you have a question? I have a question, mayor? if you don't mind my asking. Do you know if the methodology considers the wages? Um, RENA numbers typically show uh, very low, low, medium, you know, moderate. What what level of housing needs to be constructed. Um, but it's hard to tell sometimes how the decision is made for each of those number areas. And I'm wondering if you know if wages were significantly considered. For example, does our city has a particular wage profile? Would we build within that wage profile? Yeah, I actually don't know what the changes in, within the methodology were. Uh, our conversation was largely around what the positives and negatives of the sub-regionality conversation are. Uh, regardless of the new formula, those numbers will still be a top-down approach. The idea is adding a level of local control in how we actually allocate those units. Uh, and I'll tell you, many of the cities seemed very excited by the prospect of Santa Rosa wanting to build housing. I hear you. Um, so the, the idea, SCTA has not been the primary player in our housing in the past, if I remember rightly. They have not. So the shift at ABAG from being ABAG to being ABAG MTC has put SCTA more in the driver's seat. Well, and there is a nexus between your transportation planning and your housing planning, and I think that that's what SCTA is trying to acknowledge. The next steps will be by next February, SCTA will have to determine if they are going to uh, convene this sub-regional conversation, and the cities will have to pass a resolution to opt into it as well. So we'll have plenty of more time to talk about what the methodology looks like and what the potential drawbacks for a city like Santa Rosa could be in getting into that conversation. Uh, and then we'll obviously talk about what we benefit from being able to, to have a voice in that allocation. Is there any clarity it, yet it, in it, how monies will be at attached to our uh, regional housing needs? Nope. It, thank you. Right. Any other council members would like to make a report? Ms. Fleming? Yeah, I had the great pleasure to attend the North Bay Labor Council Labor Day along with uh, Vice Mayor Rogers, where we saw lots of um, organized labor, including many city employees, come out and enjoy food and music served up by lots of uh, local electeds and aspiring local electeds. I additionally had um, the opportunity to go to the Child Care Planning Council, which is held monthly at SCO um, during the, the school year, and was pleasantly surprised to get a round of applause um, for the city of Santa Rosa for leasing the Fulton Street site. Only it's the second time in our history that we've leased a site for the purposes of child care, and their gratitude was um, you know, very clear. So I wanted to pass that along since we don't always get good news. And then uh, the RED, the Renewal Enterprise District, had a, a full board meeting um, and we uh, got a large report from Michelle Whitman, texted to us, myself and, and uh, Mr. Tibbetts, and we'll just say that we looked through our criteria and we all are on the same page that we should be building uh, and funding projects that have robust community services, reducing barriers for development and seeing to it that um, these are high quality forward looking uh, structures for people to live in going forward. Thank you. 
Mr. Ashman, do you want to add something? Yeah, I apologize. I had one more thing, and uh, I can't believe I forgot it. I did want to thank staff. Uh, we did receive the draft determination from the administrative law judge overseeing the Jennings decision yesterday, uh, and against the objection of uh, SMART and other entities, uh, our staff did an incredible job on delivering a recommendation for the city to get an extension uh, of two years to get that project built. So I wanted to say thank you to, to Jason and to John Fritch and to everybody else who worked on it. Uh, you all did a really incredible job. Good news, thank you for that. Any other report, Mr. Sir? Thank you, Mayor. Um, Ms. Fleming and I attended the downtown subcommittee meeting last week. Uh, it was a, a, um, a great meeting, very, very well attended, I think in part because there was a, a, a at times emotional and um, passionate conversation around parking in our downtown and a discussion around our parking program. And uh, so we have more uh, on that in the, in, in the near future. Um, that discussion will, will come before the, the council later, um, not today. Um, also, the Railroad Square Community Benefit District Program, which we will hear more about this afternoon, uh, which is also, you know, it's, it's great to see the Railroad Square area uh, coming together in this way. They've always been very well organized, but this is really going to give them um, a whole new way of uh, participating as a retail center uh, in our downtown. And so we'll see uh, the, how that unfolds. Um, and the progress of the, of the benefit district. And finally, uh, some good news, the, the downtown plan photo contest was, was introduced by Patrick Streeter. Uh, this is an opportunity for the, for the members of our community to take um, photos of uh, things that they like and things that they don't like um, and apply that to our downtown station area specific plan update. Uh, and it's, so it is a contest and there's more information at the plan downtown sr.com it's our website um, again plan downtown sr.com um, and that will give you more information about how the how the contest functions uh, and your opportunity to for input on what is and what is not um, something that you like about Santa Rosa. You could take photos of, some, of something that's in another city. Um, however you want to get it across, it would be a, um, it's a good opportunity for input for the community, both the things that you like and the things that you'd like to change. Um, and I would think that's probably the, the highlight of, of that meeting. Um, it went over by about a half an hour, but with good reason. Great, thank you, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, several things since our last meeting alone report out on. Um, our Benna Valley Senior Center Ad Hoc Committee did meet August 29th, uh, provided feedback to staff and it'll be coming to the entire council on September 24th. Uh, I know several of you along with myself uh, attended the swearing in of our new chief of police. It was wonderful to see. I think there's, they said about 250 folks there uh, to recognize not only Chief Navarro, but also the other promotions from uh, throughout the organization. So it was a great, uh, community event. Our Climate Action Subcommittee did meet and we had four um, main topics. First about our evergreen analysis. We provided feedback uh, to staff and they'll be coming back to the entire council on November 5th. Then we also briefly discussed the all electric reach code. And by the way, there was many members, uh, this chamber was almost full, about half full. So it was great to see uh, the, the number of community members that are interested in a number of these items. But the all electric reach codes will be coming back to this entire council on October 22nd. So it's gonna be from three to five. Feel free to go to the uh, UFO if you wanna learn more about the impacts of the reach codes. We also received some feedback about whether or not the city of Santa Rosa should uh, establish a climate emergency. So some feedback was given to RCPA. And then also a little bit more update on our zero waste project. Uh, we gave feedback to uh, the consultants doing that work. And again, that will be en route to city council in the near future. Was there anything else? Okay, great. 
Uh, last Wednesday, the Santa Rosa Violence Prevention Partnership hosted a seminar at Finley. Uh, Mr. Carr did a wonderful job. Uh, over 120 participants were there, and the key presenter presented some information on trauma, how trauma affects us all, especially for those that are service providers who um, we've all experienced trauma, but then if you're trying to assist other folks with the trauma that they've experienced, how to be able to manage that. So it was a wonderful seminar. Thank you, Jason, for all the work you and your team did uh, to put into that. We also had the first screening of last October, last week, at the Finley Center. And then you mentioned the uh, oak tree. That was the first I had seen it at the Finley Center, and it's, um, it's a majestic oak. So I'm very thankful that it sounds like we're going to be able to uh, save that one. For those of you that might be interested and haven't seen it yet, the next public screening will be September 12th at 3rd Street Cinemas at 6 o'clock. And then the final public screening before, I believe it's eventually be going on to YouTube, will be September 17th in this very chamber. So two other opportunities. Uh, we have some comments being said there. And um, anyway, those will be the next two public screenings of last October. And finally, last Sunday, uh, I was able to participate in Sonoma Ready Day at Sonoma County Fairgrounds. And thank you, Mr. McGlynn. I know city staff was out there reg registering folks for SoCo Alerts. And now ready bags and those 2,500 ready bags um, disappeared within an hour and a half, two hours. So um, my hope is that we'll be able to plan another one. But it was great to see so many um, concerned community members taking proactive steps to learn more about what do we do in the case of our next disaster that's going to be affecting us. So it was a wonderful event. Hopefully more information will be coming. So with that, we will move to item 11.2, Board Commission and Committee Appointments. Uh, for members of the audience, council interviewed, I believe, five applicants for the Housing Authority Tenant Commissioner position. Um, Madam City Clerk, you want to walk us through this nomination process? Certainly. The members of the boards, commissions, and committees shall be selected from a pool of applicants, and in this instance, uh, by a process of elimination. Uh, for this Housing Authority Tenant Commissioner, each council member shall vote for an a number of applicants equal to the number of vacant positions plus two. In this instance, there is one vacancy. Those applicants receiving one vote or less shall be eliminated. Subsequent votes shall be taken with each council member voting for one less applicant than voted in the previous round. Only applicants not eliminated may be voted upon. The applicant who receives four or more votes in the final round of voting shall be appointed to fill the vacancy. We are going to initiate round one. Vote for up to three, but no less than one candidate. This will be done by roll call. We will start with Council Member Combs. Please vote for three candidates. I would like to vote for Patrice LaPera. Thank you, Council Member Fleming. Uh, Patrice LaPera, Catherine McCanleys, and Margaret Yamamoto. Thank you. Council Member Olivares. Burton, LaPera, and Yamamoto. Thank you. Council Member Sawyer. Henderson, LaPera, and McCanleys. Thank you. Council Member Tibbetts. Patrice LaPera, Noah Henderson, Margaret Yamamoto. Thank you, Vice Mayor Rogers. LaPera, McCanleys, Henderson. And Mayor Schwedhelm. Uh, Henderson, McCanleys, and Yamamoto. Thank you, one moment while I tabulate. Thank you, council members. We are going to move on to round two. On your round two ballot, please cross out Deborah Bravo Burton. She was eliminated in round one. 
In this round two, we will vote for up to two candidates, but no less than one. Council Member Combs? Patrice LaPera. Thank you. Council Member Fleming? Patrice LaPera, Catherine McCanleys. Thank you. Council Member Oliveras? Patrice LaPera. Thank you. Council Member Sawyer? Patrice LaPera, Catherine McCanleys. Thank you. Council Member Tibbetts? Patrice LaPera and Margaret Yamamoto. Thank you. Council Member Rogers. LaPera. Vice Mayor, thank you. Uh, Mayor Schwedholm. Uh, Noah Henderson and Margaret Yamamoto. Okay, one moment while I tally. Thank you, we will advance to round three. On your ballot, please cross out Deborah Bravo Burton and Noah Henderson. And we'll start with Council Member Combs. Please vote for one candidate. Patrice LaPera. Council Member Fleming. Patrice LaPera. Council Member Oliveras. Patrice LaPera. Council Member Sawyer. Patrice LaPera. Council Member Tibbetts. Patrice LaPera. Vice Mayor Rogers. LaPera. Mayor Schwedhelm. Uh, Patrice LaPera. Thank you. By a unanimous round three vote, Patrice LaPera is the new Housing Authority Tenant Commissioner position. Great. Thank you for Thank that you. process. Thank you, Council, for your feedback. And please uh, extend our thanks to all the persons who uh, applied for positions. Uh, it was a strong group of applicants. Okay, we have no minutes to approve consent items. Mr. McGlynn. Item 13.1, motion approval of the 2019 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant application. Item 13.2, motion contract award for flashing yellow left turn arrow retrofit. Item 13.3, resolution reject all bids, pave it, pavement, pavement imperative, pavement Preventive Maintenance 2019. Item 13.4, Resolution Extension of Proclamation of Local Homeless Emergency. Item 13.5, Resolution Extension of Proclamation of Existence of a Local Emergency Due to Fires. Council, any questions? Ms. Fleming. <laughs> Thank you. I'm curious to know on item 13.2, how the 39 locations for the yellow lights were, were chosen? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Grant Bailey, Associate Civil Engineer uh, with Transportation and Public Works and Project Manager for this project. Um, so your question regarding how locations were chosen. Um, so we're retrofitting existing five section head signals uh, and up upgrading them with the four section head flashing yellow arrow signals. Um, and that's virtually every single location that the five section heads are found within the city. That makes sense, thank you. And any other questions on this item? No. Um, Mr. McGlynn, I have a question on item 13.3, uh, rejecting all the bids. Lucky you, thank you. Um, my question is, this is I know not the first time since I've been to council where we've had to reject them all. This one, I think the low bid came in 41.7% over the estimate. And what I heard the last time I think we rejected and what we're hearing now is that if we submitted it during a different time, we'd have a different result. I guess my question is, are we starting to plan ahead? In other words, why don't we do it one time at the right time versus the high demand time so we don't have to do this, this process that I just gotta take 
uh, I got to assume sucks up a lot of staff time. Uh, that, that's a that's a good question. Um, so this is an annual project, and so every year we uh, complete the construction, and then we start all over again, uh, looking at our pavement condition uh, program to determine new candidates. And so um, to determine the candidates, it takes some time, and then to draft the contract, it takes some time as well. So we're doing as much as the best we can to get the contract out in a timely manner, but. Uh, given that it's an annual project and it's year over year, um, it, it, it takes some time, but we're, we're doing everything we can to streamline that process. Mr. Nutt, did you have some words of wisdom? I don't know about words of wisdom, but uh, just to add into what Mr. Bailey stated, um, some of the other things we've looked at is in talking to some and talking to the contractors and uh, other agencies out there. Uh, we have been doing work under very uh, requiring bids under a short time frame, and so one of the feedback mechanisms or one of the feedback pieces that we received was if we lengthened the time that we allowed folks to prepare their bids that we might start to see changes in our contract or in the in the bids that are received. Um, so that's something we're intending to change. That's feedback that we received following the bid process here. Uh, actually, our deputy director uh, of engineering has spent quite a bit of time working with uh, the Engineering Contractors Association to understand better why some of our bids are coming in high and some aren't. Uh, and this is one of the ones that uh, we thought time of year was the right thing, but it may actually be something uh, different, something more like the time it takes them to develop the bid itself. Uh, so um, while it is an annual process, it does take us time to put things together. There may be other considerations that we're trying to work into this as well so that we don't run into this into the future. Great. Thank you. And I, I appreciate just those efforts about getting that feedback loop. How are we going to, because I think there's only two bids on this project, you know, how are we going to get fill in the blank a bigger number and reaching out to those that provide this service, I think is very helpful. So thank you for the information. Any other questions from council? Ms. Lamy? I, I had one more question about that. Sorry, gentlemen. So again, going back to the two bids, is it typical for us to only get a couple of bids on a project like this? Again, depending upon the time of year, it's not unusual. Uh, there are there are uh, several contractors out there, but right now a lot of contractors are just busy doing a lot of things. So the later in the season, the uh, less likely you are to have multiple contractors engaged. Um, and as I mentioned, what we found out in some of the responses that the way with which we've been bidding has also been a constraint for some contractors. So as we change our processes with that feedback, we would hope to see more contractors participating. And is there any impact due to materials costs going on and from rebuild or from trade issues? We've been trying to track that and I can't say that we've seen any specific trend. Uh, bids have really gone up and down all year long and it hasn't necessarily followed whether it's a small contract or a big contract, asphalt, concrete or, constru or other construction. It's been kind of all over the board and the only consistent theme that we've heard is the two week typical bid response is not enough in this very busy environment for contractors to really think about their bids. So they're using conservative numbers that they know they can ensure completion of the project and gain what they're looking for as well as the city. Thank you. Ms. Combs. Thank you. Thank you for being down here explaining this to us. I regularly get questions from people about when their street is going to be paved or repaved or rehabbed in some way. And I also am asked, how is it that we decide which streets to pave, repave, rehab, slurry seal or not? Where do people go to find that information? I, it, it, can they find it on our website? I don't believe we have that level of detail on our website. Um, there are a couple of locations, whether, uh, the trip report um, provides documentation about what the uh, level of deficiency is within the state of California, and there does have a, a set aside, it does have a set aside for the Bay Area. Um, MTC also provides information relating to the quality of our streets, what the overall deficiency is in the Bay Area, and it does have a specific line item for the city of Santa Rosa and describes where we're at. Um, 
we haven't identified uh, a le that level of detail on our website, although there is a little bit of information. Um, it, it's something that we, we need to continue to try to educate the community as far as what our current fiscal ability is and what our fiscal requirement is in order to achieve a certain level of pavement quality. And what is our current pavement quality? Uh, we have a pavement condition index of 61 based on this spring, um, which was an increase. 61 out of 100. 61 out of 100. And, and the Barrier. 5 is our goal, or is our goal another number? The Barrier average is 66, and we don't, as a city, have a target goal. Um, the MTC or the region has a goal, and so we've been attempting to achieve that without having specific direction from council. So seven, 75 is okay. the goal. And we're currently investing about one third of what's necessary to achieve and maintain the 75 PCI. And that includes outside funds that we receive from grants and that is that is entities. all of the above, all funds that we receive that go into pavement maintenance. Okay. Um, is it possible to go on our GIS mapping system and see what your pavement number is? So we'll, 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 yeah, we'll I think we're going a little we're, I think we're, we're starting asking. to, we'll, we'll go and look at this particular issue, but a lot of the energy on the mapping side has been around the rebuild and the recovery efforts in downtown. Um, we're trying to get up to speed on a series of issues. Right now, we just don't report that out in that active way, council member. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it, and right. thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, we have one card for 13.4, uh, George Uberti. And George, and for any other comments on the consent calendar, um, I'm gonna start allowing two minutes on each item. So two minutes on each item, you could speak on whichever items you want. So you have two minutes on item 13.4. Works for me. Uh, 13.4 is the re-declaration of the local homeless emergency. Um, now, I don't know if you have an active running total of how many times we've declared it, um, but I think that there is a difference between declaring an emergency and doing something about an emergency, right? Now, we seem to be extraordinarily comfortable declaring that, and I mean, an emergency is where someone's about to die, right? That's the definition of an emergency, right? We seem fine pointing at a group of people and saying, wow, you look like you're just about to die. We don't seem fine uh, helping them at all. Uh, and my theory is that it is connected to how comfortable we are declaring it, right? We need to get a lot less comfortable with the fact that we're in a state of emergency, right? The fact that there is a regular agenda item where we just declare that an entire portion of our population is on the brink of death on a regular basis. How many times have we declared it? And how many times are we gonna declare it before we stand up and do something about it? All right, it just absolutely has to stop. You cannot be comfortable declaring an emergency. It's the opposite of everything a leader is supposed to do and everything a leader is supposed to be. And it's shameful, right? It has to stop. It has to, all right? People in this city, the homeless people in this city need us to help them, all right? If they had the tools to do it, they wouldn't be on the street, all right? They can't do it, we have to, right? It's got to get done. And the last thing that we need to do is continue to declare it. It's the last thing. The first thing we need to do is stop talking and start acting immediately. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, before we go to Mr. Rogers, I do have one request, uh, Mr. McGlynn. 13.5, the homeless emergency, there's no presentation there. I would just ask any type of an emergency. We had a presentation for the homeless emergency, which kind of gives an update. We have the, uh, I think it's the proclamation from when we first declared it, and I think our situation has changed. So I know we may be changing this in the future, but if we do have an extension of emergency, if we just get a presentation in there for a little bit with updated information, that'd be helpful. So with that, Mr. Rogers, you have this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll move items 13.1 through 13.5 of the consent calendar and away for the reading of the text. Who, who, who's our second? 
Mr. Oliveira's, it looks like. His finger's quicker than your voice. Uh, any other comments on the consent calendar? Okay, your votes, please. And we have six yeses and one in abstention with Mr. Tibbetts abstaining. All right, not quite five o'clock yet. We'll move to item 15.1, Mr. McGlynn. Item 15.1, report blanket purchase order with Axon Enterprise Incorporated for the purchase of Taser 7 equipment and licensed through the MPP GOV Cooperative Purchase Agreement. Jody Frost, Administrative Services Officer presenting. Excuse me, Chief Navarro presenting. Don't worry, Sean, I get it mixed up all the time too. Let's try this again. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. Rainer Navarro, Chief of Police. And I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, come down to be for uh, my first uh, uh, discussion in front of you. So uh, thank you for this time right now. Uh, we are here to uh, discuss the uh, request for approval for our purchase order for our Axon Taser 7 equipment. Um, and I uh, wanted to give you a brief overview of what that equipment is and uh, provide any opportunities for you to, uh, for any questions. So our, uh, the Taser 7 is actually a brand name. Uh, the, the, official, the official term for uh, that type of equipment is the conducted electrical weapon, or CEW. Uh, CEWs were developed in the 1970s, and they were basically, uh, they were developed to provide less lethal options um, f as opposed to other weapons and make those less lethal options available to officers uh, to help minimize injury. Uh, CEWs can be used effectively uh, up to about uh, 21 feet and uh, allows officers to create space in different incidents uh, to allow an added layer of safety. Uh, CEWs uh, actually fall within a, um, uh, in our uh, uh, use of force uh, options under the uh, medium level. So uh, to give you a quick background, uh, our use of force options uh, are divided into a low, medium, and high, and uh, CEWs are in the medium level, uh, similar to batons, uh, OC spray, and uh, canines, and so, uh, so it's it's uh, it, it's actually in the medium level. And the the thing about um, CEWs is it provides uh, a less lethal option that allows for quick recovery. So if you look at OC spray, um, OC spray can um, it can impact an individual for some time, and and, and sometimes up to an hour, uh, where you have to uh, deal with. Uh, providing uh, water to the individual to try to clear the eyes out. Um, and then with uh, other options such as batons, uh, you have the potential of uh, uh, potential uh, um, uh, major injury. And so uh, CEWs allow for a quick res uh, recovery time uh, after a five second, um, five second um, uh, uh, burst. Um, it allows person, a person to come back and uh, allows an officer uh, that time to take somebody into custody. Um, we uh, have been using CEW since 2003, and our uh, current ones uh, were purchased, uh, we purchase them about every five years or so. Uh, we, we purchased the X26 model back in 2008, and then we have the X26P model, which we purchased in 2013. Uh, what's we currently the the two models that we have uh, the X26 is uh, no longer supported through firmware updates by the company, and the X26P model is going to be unsupported as of December of 2019. Um, the life cycle for these uh, for these uh, 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 pieces of equipment are about five years in length. The uh, the CEWs they were. Um, originally purchased from Taser, that Taser has now become Axon. And um, again, we we have, uh, these CEWs are compatible with uh, our current 
uh, evidence storage, uh, storage program and docking stations that we use with our body-worn cameras. So uh, it is the same company, so it allows for a little bit more uh, ease for our officers, allows them to be more efficient uh, to, uh, um, to, get the, uh, to get the updates for the equipment. Uh, the firmware and software updates are done remotely uh, with this new system, um, negating the need to actually turn them in uh, for these updates. So we have, um, what we'd like to do is uh, uh, recommend the approval for the contract for the CEWs that is uh, used by patrol. It's currently being used by patrol. Uh, it equates to about $60 a month for uh, each officer. Uh, these units are, uh, will be under warranty. So under the new purchase, uh, the old ones will be uh, returned and we'll have new ones that will be under warranty. They'll have the ability to be updated. And so uh, the updates, really what that allows us to do is um, make sure the technology is, um, you know, it's up to date. So similar to other technology, everything has a lifespan. Uh, we kind of equate it to a, a, a cell phone. Uh, we all have cellular uh, cell phones or smartphones, and they have a lifespan. And sometimes they just stop working if you don't, uh, you know, if you if you hold on to them too long. What we don't want is uh, to have a piece of equipment that is not uh, readily available for an officer. And so uh, the the need to purchase new equipment is is imperative. And so uh, we currently have department departmental policies in place to uh, to address the use of, uh, of CEWs. Uh, that includes uh, um, medical response after each uh, application to make sure that people are medically cleared prior to, prior to being booked to make sure everything's okay. Uh, again, uh, the benefits are that uh, we have an, an additional less lethal option when interacting with uh, 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 subjects within the community that are hostile. Um, and who may be a danger to uh, community members or to themselves. And it provides us with uh, devices that are less likely to malfunction and it allows us to keep the technology updated and um, allows us to be more efficient. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Chief. Thank you for the presentation. Council, any questions? Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Chief, for your first presentation. Well done. I do have one question. What is the duration of the warranty on these uh, CEWs? The CEW warranty is five years. So would it be uh, reasonable to assume that these devices are meant to be active? You so said we purchase them about every five years. They give us a warranty for five years. That's basically the deal. Five years. Yes, and so uh, these updates will allow us to keep uh, track of if there's a malfunction and so um, to make sure that they're working properly. If they're not working properly, uh, we'll be able to return them to the company and they will provide a, um, uh, they will either uh, uh, fix it or provide a new uh, piece of equipment uh, under this warranty. All right, thank you. Ms. Combs. Thank you, and again, congratulations. It's a pleasure to see you to see you in particular here today. Thank you very much, uh, first day. Um, I have two questions. With regard to replacing them roughly every five years, do we have a replacement plan or have we budgeted to replace these every five years? So we are, um, we have been, um, We've been working on replacing them every five years. We are working, continuing to look at our budget and uh, 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 make uh, budgetary decisions based on the equipment that we need. And so uh, we are looking out and uh, seeing what we need to do in five years from now. Thank you. And my second question is, I thought I heard you say that we do have a use of force policy that includes CEWs. Where do I find that on our website? It's a very good question. Uh, we have our, all of our policies are accessible through the Santa Rosa Police Department website at uh, santarosapolice.org. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, happy to have you here for your first presentation, Chief. Uh, I hope we'll make it a little bit uh, difficult for you. 
Uh, I did have a question. You used the analogy of the cell phone. I think that that's actually a good way to, to think about the updates and the ability that we'll have with this technology to have updates in the field and not necessarily when you have to turn them in. But one of the things that I do notice with my cell phone is sometimes it gets an update and it stops working properly. Uh, and whether that's planned obsolescence and designed or whether it's just a bad update, uh, how are we going to make sure that officers who are going through that process in the field have the the, the weapon actually tested before they're in a situation where they need to rely on it. Yes. Yeah, so uh, each officer uh, tests their uh, their equipment prior to uh, prior to their shift. So we do have a system in place where number one, they're going to be uh, updated on a regular basis. Uh, they're tested prior to the beginning of shift, and uh, we go through. Um, in the last five years, we've have, had over 2,300 hours of. Uh, taser specific training and so we we include our training of our uh, CEWs into our defensive tactics and uh, de-escalation techniques and so when we do those um, uh, uh, one of the, the common uh, uh, one of the common things that we do is to um, check our check our equipment and make sure that things are working properly right thank you any other questions okay I have one card on this item George Uberti So I had the good fortune of witnessing some members of the Santa Rosa Police Department uh, use these weapons. Um, and if I could pick two words to describe that interaction, it would be completely unnecessary. Um, completely unnecessary. As you may be familiar, I used to work with people that have special needs, right? I've taken quite a few lumps. Uh, working with people that were, number one, very large, number two, very unhappy and willing to be violent. Uh, at no point was I armed, and at no point did I need to use force against them uh, to hurt them or restrain, you know, in any way. It's just unnecessary. Now, I'll hear you on less lethal options, right? Sure. Let's step away from killing the people we're supposed to protect, right? Let's step as far away from it as we need to, because that man was a danger to nobody. He was an old man, 150 pounds soaking wet. He had a stick in his hand and he was out of his mind, all right? He wasn't standing near anybody. I was sitting right there reading a newspaper. He wasn't a danger to me, and there was nobody else there for him to be a danger to, right? The police were a danger to him, and accordingly, he was injured uh, through the use of a taser. Right? Why are we spending our money on this? Right? The, the warranty is out on them. I don't hear that that means that they don't work. They seem like they work fine to me. Man fell over, you know, good chance he crapped his pants. Every time we use one of them, we have to get an ambulance coming out that's expensive. It's unnecessary. It damages the people we're supposed to be protecting. Right? There are plenty of non lethal options that don't involve weapons at all. I can give you the name, uh, one of them, Oregon Intervention Systems, right? These are, these are uh, called planned physical interventions that you can use, right? You train people to use, they're preventative in nature, they don't injure anybody. My point is this, right? If you are a public servant, right? If you're serving the public, then what you do is assume risk, right? That's what makes being a police officer a job that is worthy of respect, right? You put yourself in harm's way. Your job is supposed to be more dangerous than others, right? So if what we do as a city is spend money so you can hurt us rather than assume risk and on, on our behalf, then what are we doing? What is your job? It's not protecting us, right? It's hurting us so that you're protected, and that's wrong, right? We shouldn't have a department of that, right? It's exactly the opposite of what the police should put. Let's explore less than lethal options. Let's explore options that meaningfully give people with who are in danger. They, this man had mental health issues, right? He needed help. He didn't need to be shot with anything. All right. Thank you. Council, any additional questions? Seeing none, Mr. Oliveras, you have this 
I think Mayor, move a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving a blanket purchase order with Axon Enterprises Incorporated Scottsdale, Arizona for the purchase of Taser 7 equipment and applicable licensing for a five year period under National Purchasing Partners uh, Cooperative Agreement contract number uh, VH11630 in an amount not to exceed $666,491.40. And wait for the reading of the text. We have a motion and a second. Any final comments? Your votes, please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we will go back to item uh, 14 public comment on non agenda matters. I've got one card Maji Osuji. Hi, uh, um, I wanted to tell you, uh, Sunday morning I woke up in a great mood because Sabbath was over and then there was a 73 year old at my door crying because um, Howie Patrol took his car. They took his car when it had broken down in the night, he said he could fix it really easily in daylight. And they took his car, they said that it was um, ruining his pro the property values of his house is what the Highway Patrol officer told him. So he told the 73-year-old man with cancer and heart disease that he was ruining his property values by being in his car when he didn't even intend to park it there. So it's, you know, it's an AFP car, as someone that age would have. And I was really upset about this, wondering why uh, about 60 of them have come to my house that are way older than me to tell me these stories, hoping that I will tell you. It's a lot of times I don't want to come tell you the stories, because I get too upset, I'll just scream. I would just scream probably. But I walked through the, the uh, flea market at the veg hall and I saw this picture and this is a native woman who's gathered sticks going into her teepee. And I bought it, I bought like 12 of these for historical photos because I'd rather live in a teepee. And I know he would too, Nick Carter's native, although he looks black to you, because people don't know, the red star in his eyes means. Um, and that inspired me to think about this photo quite a lot. So I'll give you a copy of. Um, it's not really a poem. It says, sometimes in a cold place. The trees drop branches for me all hot summer and fall so I won't be cold in the winter. And if I don't pick them up, massive tinders build massive fires. I'm part of the ecosystem. I'm sacred to this forest you kick me out of. My sister arrested for sleeping. My brother arrested for a dog poop too near him. My grandfather crying because Highway Patrol yelled at him while taking his third lost car in a year and that he, a 73-year-old, was bringing down his property values he built on stolen land. Sometimes I want to turn my back on you and hide in my teepee, but I can't because my religion and my instinct is illegal. Thank you. Do we have any other cards on this item? All right, Mr. McGlynn, item 15.2. Item 15.2, report Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District Resolution of Intention. Raisa De La Rosa, presenting. Actually, uh, Rafael Rivero, Economic Development Specialist with the, our division will be reporting on this item. Good afternoon, uh, distinguished members of the City Council, Honorable Mayor Schwedel. I'm very delighted to be here this afternoon. So I'm here to talk to you about the uh, Community Benefit District in Railroad Square. Um, uh, the item before you, the, the, the item before is the Community Benefit District petition result as a, as a resolution of intention to establish an assessment district. Uh, this is the first of two uh, city council driven steps for the potential creation of a second community benefit district in our city. 
The second potential item will be the resolution of formation and hearing, which is scheduled for October 29th. Should the council choose to initiate the ballot process and should those ballots show adequate support or formation? I'm going to go to, I'm going to spend a little bit of time with this slide because it has a lot of background and uh, there's a lot of uh, enthusiasm and energy behind it. So I got to give you uh, some, some uh, deep specific details. Um, so just to tell you how we got here, the interest in creating the assessment district stems from the concept of uh, levying assessments on real uh, properties within the proposed district to fund uh, physical improvements to individual properties attract new customers, and increase uh, business sales. The assessments funds uh, maintenance, special events, and activities and other special benefits within the uh, district, uh, revitalizing the area, creating jobs, attracting and retaining businesses, and reducing crime. The formation of our first community benefit district uh, in Santa Rosa, uh, which by the way has been uh, very successful so far, seemed very appealing to the uh, property owners and business owners of the uh, Railroad Square area, which is the uh, downtown sister area. I like to call it that. The, um, for, um, do that in, in the uh, fall of 2018, the Railroad Square Association worked to gauge support within the community for a new special benefit district for both the Santa Rosa Railroad Square, property owners, and business community alike. The City of Santa Rosa tapped the services of New City America. Again, uh, those, that is the uh, consultant that uh, helped us form the first community benefit district. So. Um, we knew all along that we were hiring somebody with tremendous expertise and knowledge. A survey was uh, uh, created and circulated uh, to all property owners uh, to ascertain the level of support and interest for the establishment uh, of the um, Railroad Square Community Benefit District. The support for the concept uh, of the new railroad square was overwhelming. The survey tallied the, uh, the support based upon uh, the property variables that would assess in the ultimate funding of the uh, special benefit services of the district. Those property variables, and this is very important, include the parcels, lot size, linear frontage, and building square footage. Since the in, in uh, initiation of work last fall, um, and we have participated in, in all of the meetings, the Railroad Square Community Benefit District Steering Committee, formed by uh, property owners, business owners, uh, and I like, including Mike Montague from uh, TVAX, worked diligently to outreach property owners and, and, and build a level of support for the new Community Benefit District. The steering committee met multiple times, reviewed various iterations of a management plan, and finalized the boundaries, the boundaries, services, costs, and terms at a meeting held uh, in April of, uh, of this year. However, not all the support was there, so the uh, committee took some pause between the months of May and June. But in, on July 10th, 2019, and then again on August 11th, uh, made final adjustments to a new plan, uh, a, 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 a little bit more of a reduced uh, plan, including um, less uh, properties and such. With the enabling ordinance and adoption in uh, March uh, 2018, our consultant was able to release the petitions and move us forward into where we are today. The district formation requires a submission of petition from property owners in the proposed district representing more than 30% of the total assessment to be paid by the community benefit district. In August 2019, just last month, the petition packets, including a summary of the uh, management uh, district plan, uh, which I believe is in, in your packet, um, and, re and return envelope, uh, were mailed to each property owner within the proposed Railroad Square area of the Community Benefit District. The petition return deadline was September 6. Property owners representing the minimum requirement of 30% um, completed the petition 
meeting that 30% thresh, threshold needed. Um, as of uh, this morning, uh, we were at 31% of uh, the petition percentages, and that still doesn't include uh, the city's uh, portion or, or lot. So I'm gonna talk now a little bit about the, um, the proposed uh, community benefit area. If you're familiar with uh, Railroad Square, which I assume you are, it's a beautiful area, very rich in, uh, in history uh, of our city here in Santa Rosa. Uh, the proposed uh, uh, area um, consists of approximately 18 square blocks, um, 92 parcels owned by 58 property owners, including um, a parcel owned by the city of Santa Rosa. The following in include uh, five uh, different uh, benefit zones within the proposed railroad square community benefit district. Three of the benefit zones are geographically based. The fourth is land use based, reflecting the unique nature of residential condominiums throughout the district. So if you can see on that map uh, there on the, on the slide, uh, zone one, which is the green area. Those are the core properties, and that includes, uh, it uh, extends from uh, the north of Third Street, from the uh, 101 freeway on the east and the railroad, railroad, railroad tracks uh, on the west up, the, uh, up to A Street uh, um, on the north. Uh, there is a benefit zone 1A, uh, which uh, will have a reduced cost, and that is for office-related building square footage if office is used um, in the uh, predominant, predominant use uh, for that building. Zone two, the orange uh, area, which um, are the two uh, to the south, uh, are the two large hotels south uh, of Third Street and east uh, of the rail tracks. Uh, zone three in yellow, uh, looks kind of greenish there on the screen, but looks yellow on, on my screen. Uh, those are the parcels west to the uh, rail tracks north of the east, uh, north and east of the Santa Rosa Creek and, and south of Sixth Street. And then zone four, uh, that includes uh, all residential condos in zones uh, one and three. Annual assessments are, are based upon the an allocation of uh, program costs and accessible linear frontage plus lot or parcel square footage plus accessible building square footage and in the case of residential condominiums by actual building unit square footage. Current and future residential condominium owners are assessed differently since condominiums include actual building square footage that are not necessarily on the ground level. Therefore, uh, linear frontage and lot size are not relevant to residential condominiums. Um, I'm gonna now go to slide three. And this talks a little bit about the uh, first year annual budget. So um, again, as I mentioned, uh, the months of May and June, uh, the committee took a little pause. Uh, they needed to kind of downsize the, the area a little bit to gain that momentum and build on that support. So the total uh, first uh, year of the assessment revenue is proposed uh, at uh, the calculation of 233, uh, one, $123,000. 122. It's important to know that the special benefits fund, funded by the district will not replace uh, uh, the city's funded general benefits. That's really important to, to, to note in. That obligation does not go away. Uh, and uh, we have experience with our uh, new um, downtown community benefit district that it, uh, it's created a, a great partnership because we're constantly communicating and working with city staff as well as um, employees of the uh, newly formed uh, DAO uh, in bringing improvements to our downtown. So the special benefits to the parcel owners are over and above those general benefits provided by the city. In looking at this chart, if you take away the 19% for program management and administration, contingency and reserves, 81% of that money 
will go towards programming. Examples of the programs include civil sidewalks or civil sidewalk operations, uh, steam cleaning, beautification projects, maintenance of existing and public new spaces, private security, maintenance, and attractive appearance of the district. District identity and marketing and placemaking would include website development, social media, holiday and seasonal decorations, branding of Railroad Square CBD properties, banner program, public art displays, connectivity to downtown, smart, and serving as a gateway to Santa Rosa. Finally, slide three. Um, I'd like to take uh, this moment uh, before uh, we go ahead and make the recommendation. I want to clarify that this resolution of intention does not yet obligate the city or any property owner to this assessment. The ballot, like the petition, need to be tabulated based on the weighted value of the parcel assessment to total assessments. They would be tabulated in a public hearing and we would need a simple majority, we're looking for a 50% or more to get to pass it and get us to the resolution of formation. It is recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the council by resolution authorize the city manager to sign the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District petition and forthcoming ballot, receive and file the district petition results, and state the intention to form the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District and to levy and collect assessments within such districts, district, approve the management district plan and the engineer's report, set in motion the balloting by directing the city clerk to mail ballots to the proposed CBD property owners and schedule the public hearing for October 29th, 2019. Okay, that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions. Great, thanks, Rafael. Questions, Mr. Vice Mayor? Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. One, if you could go back to the map of the district. So there's quite a bit of uh, smart property that's there. Have they been engaged in this conversation? Um, yes, they, they have. They have been. Um, it's an interesting area. Um, the, during the months of, uh, fr from the fall of 2018, uh, the survey was mailed out to not just where the areas that are highlighted, but even beyond that. And the response was overwhelming with the desire to create a community benefit district. So the boundary was actually a little larger than what it appears at the moment. However, I can say specifically too about the smart property. Um, so in to what Rafael is speaking about, um, the the initial outreach was to SMART and to engage SMART. However, the uh, property transferred ownership uh, in July, uh, and so it shifted to the uh, contact was, at the time, SMART was not able to um, obligate uh, the property to any additional fees due to the contract, the real estate contract they were in. Yeah, and I guess that's actually exactly where my question was going to go, is we've had a development project that has uh, languished, for lack of a better way to put it, and I just want to make sure that any additional fees or assessments that we're putting on, that the eventual owner and developer is involved in that as well, and that's not going to impact that project. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, and then if you could go to the chart, that's the percentage uh, breakdown. 18% uh, for the management and administration. Uh, seems a bit high to me. I know typically uh, inefficient government programs were usually around three or four percent. How does this compare to the CBD that was done for Courthouse Square in terms of amount of the funding that goes towards admin administration? It's comparable. Okay. Uh, right. In, in fact, um, the, uh, the Railroad Square Association is looking for uh, the possibility of a partnership to reduce, a potentially reduce program administration costs if they uh, work, for example, in, in coordination with the DAO and some of the contracts that they have available. Excellent. And at that point, uh, nothing that we're doing today would prevent them from changing this split 
if they were to be able to reduce that? No, no. Great, thank you. Ms. Collins. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation on this. This is actually a pretty exciting development. I'm really looking forward to seeing this move forward for Railroad Square. Um, I, I am a little confused about a couple of things, and I wonder if we can look at the map, which I think is slide three. Um, is the area that we're talking about just the green area? Uh, it says it, the proposed area is bordered by and then names some places, and those streets would eliminate the orange and the yellow. So I just want to make sure I understand, based on what I'm reading, which areas are included. Yeah, well, it's the entire area that Everything is, that is that orange, it's, green, yellow, yes, and blue yeah, are yeah. all included. So the bordered by statement is not really accurate in terms of a border. It's almost as if um, it's it's a little different from that. I just, okay. I was, I found it a little confusing. So um, it goes up to, but not under Highway 101. So the parking that's under Highway 101 is not included. That's correct. The parking okay. under Highway 101 is uh, owned, those parcels are owned by Caltrans um, okay. and do not historically participate in assessment districts. Okay, thank you. And I guess this is a question for the city attorney perhaps more. Um, do the private security firms that are hired by entities like this need to follow the policies that have come out of lawsuits like the Boise decision, legal discussions like the Boise decision? Um, I'm, this particular neighborhood has a significant impact uh, of homeless people. And I know the DAO it, talks to us a lot about managing homeless population in the downtown as well. Um, when they hire private security for civil streets, um, do they have to follow Boise decisions? They will have to follow um, constitutional limitations, but they are not going to be subject to, for example, the preliminary injunction that the city has uh, uh, entered into. So we're sort of setting up a system, a secondary system here where folks can hire security that doesn't have to meet the same obligations as the city police department does with regard to homelessness? I think that's getting into some details that uh, probably isn't appropriate at, at this time, but uh, we'll certainly uh, work with Raisa and Raphael uh, okay. to address that so uh, the issue. Next, the next slide, then, that we are essentially authorizing or not this kind of breakdown for the use of the funds. So it seems to me that once we see something like civil sidewalks that includes um, the hiring of, uh, of an independent security system that, that opens this conversation. Right, so those are, um, that's what's proposed. Um, for example, right now in the uh, downtown uh, community benefit district area, they use what is called ambassadors. Um, we were very, very clear with the downtown action organization that um, any um, interactions uh, with people on the street have to uh, abide by the city regulations that we um, have to abide by. Um, so, that's so specifically, part of well, uh, it's part of the training. So specifically, as it re in relation to homeless, there were special uh, training um, that one uh, that occurred uh, with their ambassadors on tr on uh, homeless uh, interactions and um, what the rights of uh, homeless people in the area are. Uh, in addition, uh, the downtown action organization works closely with the. Uh, I forget what it's called, but the homeless organizations that we're all host working or with, whatever the host, or you, <laughs> right? All of those. Um, so uh, first calls, they do, uh, they do not uh, take on uh, anything that would be considered something that would be in the realm of police, um, and they also 
uh, bring in like Catholic Church and the other host uh, organizations that work with the homeless so that there's a seamless interaction. Does this entity also have that agreement with us? Uh, not at this time. This uh, district is not, is not yet formed, but uh, we would anticipate uh, similar to what we did with the downtown or the Courthouse Square area merchant or association. The other that day. they would have to do the same thing as well. The, um, the so trainings can, were very sensitive to that. Can piece. we make our decision contingent? Um, the, yeah, there isn't, um, it doesn't, it, there is no there there yet. Um, it, I would say, I think, if I recall, this came up during the Courthouse Square, the Downtown Action Organization, um, and we, I believe we're not able to do that at that time, so uh, we were proactive in addressing your concerns um, okay. during the formation and, of the board and, 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 and I would. Laws. I would concur that um, this is not the time that we can put the condition on, um, but right, the history, uh, the history with respect to our other um, uh, community benefit district is that those were addressed at the at the point that the organization was stood up, and and uh, okay. at that point those details are worked through. Um, but at this point, there there's there isn't a mechanism for for making that conditions. Excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. Sure. The, the, I would ask that staff bring this detail forward at the appropriate time then. Yeah. Noted. May I, may I add? Understanding that this is a serious problem in the area. Perfect. Uh, we've made note of that. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Ms. Fleming? Thank you very much, and great presentation, Raphael. Right, so you guys did a great job. I have um, a curiosity and then um, a question about the contract. Um, one is, if you go to slide, um, I believe it's slide three, where you have the uh, parcels laid out, you did make mention that the city owned a parcel. Could you point to it uh, or let us know which one it is? It is the one uh, located. Uh, what color is it? It's green. Is it green? Okay. Yes. It's one of the green ones. One of the big green ones. Uh, one of the little no, green it's actually ones. blue. It's that little one across from. It's the um, depot uh, park area. Oh, yeah. It's the California yeah, yeah. Welcome Center. Oh, or, or the one that gets flooded, our little pool downtown. No? I'm not familiar with that, but um, oh, it's I know, the no, parking know lot um, yeah. across from Smart. Okay. They have the depot building. Yeah, yeah. And um, does that, um, so does the city then get a vote on that? This is just out of curiosity. Yes. The uh, weight of our vote is 1.45%, and it's one of the actions that you're uh, acting on tonight is giving the city manager authorization to sign that petition. to our proxy is. So yeah. our supreme authority on this will be Mr. McGlynn. <laughs> Okay, well, we, we will hopefully entrust him with that awesome power. Um, I'm wondering, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering if, um, because I, I was not here when we went into contract with New City America, and I'm assuming that the council entered into the contract with New City America for both the downtown action organization and as well as this community, proposed community benefit district, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how much the contract was for. Can somebody tell me? Uh, the initial contract, I believe, was for uh, $90,000, uh, and we did bring it to council and then amended it uh, be to incorporate the second formation, uh, and I believe that was uh, 80000 if I recall correctly. And does the, if the community benefit district is formed, will they reimburse the city for the cost of the contract? We did not include that in uh, part of the management agreement, uh, so no. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions? I just have a uh, clarifying question for the um, city attorney regarding the Boise decisions. Isn't there um, discrepancies between public property and private property? Uh, yes, there is. In other words, and, and I, I between, don't want any miscommunication that if there, if it's private property and there are some behaviors that are illegal, the private property owner is not bound by Boise or any other injunctions that the city of Santa Rosa may be currently experiencing. Yes, there are. There's a distinction between public property, private property, public officials, and private officials. Um, so, great. Thank you. Do we have any cards on this item? No. Alrighty, uh, Mr. Sawyer, I think you have this item. Thank you, Mayor. 
I'd like to introduce a resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa, authorizing the city manager to sign the petition and forthcoming ballot. Receiving the district petition results, directing the city clerk to file the, the district petition results and stating its intention to establish the Santa Rosa Railroad Square Community Benefit District and to levy and collect assessments within such district pursuant to local enabling ordinance. Article 5 to Chapter 6-56 of the Santa Rosa City Code relating to the establishment of community benefit districts and appointing a time and place for hearing objections thereto. And wait for the reading. Second. So a motion second, any additional comments? See none, your votes please. And we have six ayes and what an abstention, that being Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you. Mr. McGlynn, item 15.3. I'm sorry, Mr. Nutt, item 15.3. Item 15.3, report, parks measure, initial and long-term priority plan. Uh, Jen Santos, Deputy Director of Parks, presenting. Good afternoon, Mayor Schwedhelm, Vice Mayor Rogers, and Council Members. I'm Jen Santos, Deputy Director for Parks, and we're here tonight to talk about uh, Measure M. I like to call the Parks Measure to reduce confusion with the other Measure Ms that are out there. Um, as a brief overview, I wanted to take a look at what has happened with the Parks Measure uh, in the last year. Uh, last year, Council did uh, by resolution support the October 2nd, uh, in October 2nd, uh, supporting Measure M, and the county placed it on the uh, voters' ballot in 2018. In November, it of course passed, and it went into effect April 1st, 2019, and expires March 31st, 2029. Uh, as a reminder, it's estimated to generate 11.5 million annually countywide. The city itself is estimated to receive about 1.9 million annually. Uh, the measure has a maintenance of effort requirement, uh, which allows funding to be used for park supplemental and does require us to keep a baseline commitment of budget uh, equal to the year, uh, 20 fiscal year 15-16. This is, uh, I apologize, directly copied from the measure, but I wanted to be really clear that this is not in any order. Uh, but we have uh, six items essentially that the county is allowing the funds to be used on. Uh, maintenance, of course, at the top. Uh, improvements, specifically for athletic fields, playgrounds, restrooms, picnic areas, and other amenities. Uh, expansion of parks for bikeway, bikeways, public guard, and recreational and historic facilities and trails. Uh, planning and development for bike paths and trails with connection to schools, community spaces, and regional trails providing recreational, educational, and health programs for the community, and uh, last but not least, reducing fire risk. And one thing we've done initially, we've been working on this a while, um, but this was an initial uh, way of helping us determine uh, how to figure out our priorities and what the reporting and transparency items would be. So the first two items are looking at making the determination for our priorities, uh, specifically community outreach. We really want to find out what does the community want and need from the city uh, to use this measure on. So we are looking at developing that citywide outreach program with our communications team. And then to maintain that citywide outreach effort ongoing. And uh, secondly, we'd like to hire a consultant to look at our deferred maintenance needs within the parks districts. We have, um, it's something similar to what facilities did to understand where our deferred maintenance is and what is the worst first case scenario. And we're looking for that consultant to give us some priority recommendations similar to uh, what the facilities assessment did. And uh, last but not least, there's always our reporting and transparency. Uh, we will be working with the Board of Community Services recommendations and uh, going back to them at least every six months. Uh, we've uh, brought this to them already once before and we plan to go back again. 
and we're looking to receive council's approval annually during the budget process. And as part of the measure, there's a Citizens Independent Oversight Committee that will be looking at this annually. They report to the county uh, parks and the county parks, I think it turns to the county supervisors who then uh, comes back to the um, city councils individually. So just a little reminder of some of the existing funding sources we have in parks. Um, as a baseline for us to look at the measure. Parks projects are traditionally supported by the park development impact fees per zone. There's four quadrants in the cities, there's four zones that represent that. The general fund occasionally, as well as grant funding and FEMA could be considered a grant in this case. A recreational program is generally funded by the general fund. We have specifically, of course, Measure O, which supports rec uh, neighborhood services. And uh, maintenance for parks and recreation is general funded. And we do, we do have a deferred park and recreation maintenance that is not necessarily associated with a specific funding source at this time. Uh, we know that we have um, preliminary early rough drafts of about $49 million in deferred maintenance needs. Um, that's of course preliminary. We were looking to hopefully have a consultant help us with our understanding our true needs. Um, and just as a reminder of the cost of doing business, <laughs> I added in here sample project costs um, for projects. Uh, Bear Park, for instance, uh, was $13 million from acquisition, design, and, and construction. And Prince Gateway, similarly, uh, when the spray ground was updated, it included a new restroom, so that's design and construction at $1.1 and Coffee Park, uh, we're still looking at an estimate a little bit under $5 million, and we hope to have some more information soon. But the, I just wanted to put that out there as a reminder of those costs. They do get high, and of course the timing um, can be tricky on some of them. They do take time. So looking at our initial plan for the first two years, we thought what could we do the first two years? Uh, what we really wanna do is fund the portions of the fire damaged parks that is not being funded by other sources. And those would be Coffee, Rincon Ridge, Fur Ridge, Nagasawa, and Francis Nielsen Parks. We are hoping to have more information by the end of 2020 on how much those costs would be. Um, we have an estimated funding of items uh, covered by FEMA for non-FEMA uh, covered items, I'm sorry, around $3,450,000. So that's what our expectation is right now. That is definitely a moving target with FEMA, uh, but we know that there's a need there and we would uh, like to commit some of those funds to that source. Uh, secondly, the consultant deferred maintenance recommendations. We would like to hire a consultant, put together that RFP as soon as possible and get that out so that we can start to learn what our true deferred needs are in the city. Right now we have a guesstimate, we really want some accurate information. And we estimate that need for that contract to be around 250 to $350,000 based on the facilities needs assessment that was similar. And I'm gonna continue on, I'm gonna go off slide here for a minute because I've been working really hard with our communications team and um, we're gonna cover this topic, but I wanna just go off a little bit. We have put together this initial community outreach plan, which is the core of what we would like to develop uh, along with our uh, fire-related projects, our deferred maintenance. The outreach is uh, just as important. We really need to develop that plan. And so the communications team, uh, Jason Carter and Adrian Mertens and our marketing outreach team, have we've all been working together to strategize about how to do that. And um, we've come up with something that might be helpful for you uh, in September and October. We plan to gather input on engagement opportunities to include in outreach and engage, include in our outreach and engagement plan. Um, we're obviously here today at City Council to receive hopefully some feedback from you on what sort of strategies and, and things we should be doing to collect information from the community. We have met already with the Board of Community Services that has made a recommendation uh, for uh, your approval for this initial and long-term plan. Uh, we planned, I've already got a plan to meet with the Community Action, or Community Advisory Board, I'm sorry, on September 24th. 
and the partnership poly policy and operations team in October. Uh, Jason Carter has identified at least 50 groups we can meet with. Um, it's very ambitious. We will see um, how we can do that. And that's what we're going to be doing over the next couple months is making those determinations of how can we strategize and meet with these folks in the most effective ways. Uh, we'll be developing that outreach plan for specific community events. We did this similar in, um, in some of our grant applications where we met specifically with groups who were already meeting in communities. It's, it was very effective collect, uh, to collect meaningful feedback. Uh, we will also um, hold seven community meetings at least uh, within the, to make sure we're covering each district, but also covering each quadrant of city, which is similar to how we collect funds in the park development impact fees. Uh, we're going to strategize and hopefully receive feedback from you about tactics and reaching certain audiences that we definitely want to include. I'm happy to see all the soccer folks here today. Um, hopefully uh, we can meet with them as well, because I know there's a need for soccer fields as well. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're hearing the community. We will be developing metrics to make sure we have um, heard the community and that we are circling back with them. Uh, are we strategizing the right way? Did we hear you? Did we make sure that we have uh, shown you that we've heard you? Um, and so we'll be strategizing those ways of how we interact with the community over the next couple months. In uh, November, we plan to produce an outreach plan, uh, launch the plan, uh, which will include a website where people can go to receive information. Since this is a citywide initiative, uh, we really want to allow people to understand what this is all about, understand what sort of information we need to collect, and uh, provide that opportunity for folks who may not be able to attend any meetings or any other opportunities. Um, but that plan is to create a, um, uh, an overarching plan that we can implement in Janu January. Uh, we also want to develop uh, through that process, uh, the types of educational information we should be providing to the community. Uh, for example, in some of our other parks, we often include um, park adjacent maps. What do we already own? How many soccer fields do we have? How many pickleball courts do we operate? Things like that so the community can provide meaningful feedback. And also some of the information we've been thinking about is uh, what, what sort of funding sources do we already have and where can we make connections to use funds together to better strategize and uh, provide the city with what they've needed. I know since this past I've heard a lot of anecdotal information about folks who can't wait to see a difference in this. And so I'm actually really excited to go out and meet with the community and find out what they need because even outside of Measure M, we needed to do this as a city. We actually don't have this information. So it's, it's a really great opportunity for us to hear from the community on a citywide basis. And so then in January, we'd be looking at um, launching into the actual meetings, uh, more uh, strategic and definite information on the website for uh, uh, getting specific feedback on questionnaires and things like that. We already have the six items that the county is allowing funding for, and we'll be developing over the next few months the other questions that we should be asking to help us collect that meaningful feedback and make sure we're getting a citywide, a real true citywide effort, and especially meeting uh, underserved communities. So I'm going to just circle back and make sure I didn't miss anything on that because that was a lot of information. Uh, so essentially we're looking at developing and strategizing that program in the next few months with a launch in January. And um, it's difficult to launch something going into the holidays, so we really are looking at launching something in January where you can, people are refreshed and ready to restart again and think about their parks, and that gives us that time to provide, uh, pre prepare that meaningful strategy for outreach and, and start meeting. And as I said, meanwhile, uh, we, this team, this community team, this communications team will be meeting with our partners partners to understand uh, if we are asking the right questions and what sort of questions we should have starting here tonight. And so uh, that was the first two years, the initial plan. The remainder of the years, we're looking at coming back with all of the information we have collected in the community, city council, board of community services, 
uh, and CAB and different places where we've been and coming back with an analysis of what we uh, have found and receiving feedback, especially from the Board of Community Services. Um, they traditionally do hear many of our uh, needs and wants in the community, and it would be helpful for us to hear from them and um, give us some priorities on, I and mean, give us some direction on whether we're hitting that long-term, uh, that short-term initial study that we've been doing. So we are gonna analyze all the data from the first couple years, and then we're gonna come back with this long-term plan of what we would like to do. And so we're looking at something initially in March and April, April of 2021, maybe some initial feedback from that website. And then we're gonna to look to come back um, uh, every year annually to the Board of Community Services uh, to update that, because we will be continually updating the um, long-term plan based on the feedback we're receiving from the community as well as our city departments and partners and city council with a strategy to come back to council every year during the annual budget process. Um, this allows us, like master plans, to be flexible. Master plans are working living documents and we hope that this initial and long-term plan can be a working living document that will help us respond to the community and allow us some flexibility to uh, provide the community with what they need or desire as we um, hear from them. So the next steps for us are to uh, develop that outreach plan. Of course, it's a little bit repeat here, but just wanna make sure that is our next step is develop that outreach plan. We've already started meeting and we'll continue. I hope to get some good feedback from the CAB in September and to start that process of hiring our consultant to understand our deferred maintenance needs. And we will be required obviously to report to the county annually and we'll be receiving a county auditor's update annually. Um, and we'll be coming back to the council annually during the budget process to get feedback and updates. Um, well, I thought that was gonna take longer. <laughs> um, essentially, our, our recommendation is, of course, that the council, by resolution, approve the parks measure initial and long-term plan to provide for recreation and parks uses as defined within the Sonoma, Sonoma County Measure M. Thank you. <laughs> and you're open for comments, I'm sure. All right, council, any questions? Fleming? Thank you, great presentation, Jen. Thanks. Um, I have a couple of questions about how we um, are going to engage with neighborhoods. Um, I see that you have uh, identified that you're gonna engage with eight neighborhood associations, and in my experience, neighborhood associations tend to be more uh, connected groups of folks than the general public, so I'm wondering how we're going to get to the less connected groups of folks. We, we'll be working with, I'll be working with Jason Carter and Adrian. He has identified about 50 groups, including underserved communities um, that we can connect with. And uh, we are trying to strategize to make sure we are reaching members of the community who don't often participate who are underserved, as well as the residents who do like to give us their feedback regularly. Yeah, those are the, the easy ones to get, huh? Um, right. So uh, the other thing that I noticed, and I think it's on slide six, is that uh, um, you identify uh, the fire affected parks, and I'm wondering if there's a, a way that we can enrich this uh, selection based in addition to um, being fire affected, but also based on population. Like for example, Coffee Park has a fairly sizable population near it, whereas I'm not certain that Rankin Ridge, Fur Ridge, Nagasawa, or Francis Nielsen have the population centers that would justify us initiating our precious funds in that region. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can certainly look at that. I know um, Coffee Park had the, uh, obviously the, uh, the most damage, the highest cost to repair the park. Uh, whereas Rincon Ridge, Fur Ridge, and Francis Nielsen are neighborhood parks. They do um, tend to serve a smaller group than the community parks, such as Nagasawa. Uh, but we can definitely look into how Would we it can be look possible at that. without being onerous on staff time to bring us back a breakdown by at least we'll just say the, the four parks that are in Fountain Grove to bring back a, a cost assessment? Because if you come back and you tell me it's gonna cost $10,000 to fix the, uh, the, the water system at 
you know, for a ridge, you know, that's not a lot of money to get a park operational. Whereas um, I'm wondering if, you know, where I'm going with this is, have we looked at initiating new parks to match all the new building that we're doing in the southern part of the city? Yes, we do. Uh, we, we rely on the general plan essentially as developments come through and uh, either require the in lieu fees or the park development of park itself. And um, since the city, since the county, we annexed it into there, we've been really working hard to make sure that we are uh, providing those parks in the spaces where the general plan has designated. Uh, it is a process of looking at development as it comes in. Um, and what options we have for funding something in advance of development. So we look to partner with developers sometimes or look at what options they might include for us. I know that's kind of complicated, but yeah, it, is, okay. it is a complicated process, but we do, uh, we do have an e equal plan in the general plan that provides a, an appropriate amount of park space, and we heavily rely on that as well as our folks in planning and economic development when subdivision developments come in. Right, because when this comes back around, it would be great to see mentions of, of parks that are gonna be meeting the needs of our population centers as they grow. And as far as I can tell, Fountain Grove is not growing at a, at a real fast rate. Um, the other thing that I was curious about um, is, and this is a really tough question, and I won't be, no, it's, it's, I'm not expecting you to be able to answer it is what I'm prefacing, and I'm okay. not even necessarily directing that. When we, authorize affordable housing, do we lose the the, tax, the benefit, the cost per door benefit that we would normally assess in a regular housing development? That is a really good question that I do not have an answer to. Do I wasn't know? expecting yeah. you to. Council member, we'll get back to you with yeah. an answer on that. Okay. So essentially where I'm going with this is um, I would love to hear what our plan is for making sure we have equitable parks across the city. Great, thank you. Mr. Sawyer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm curious, and it may be difficult to answer this as well, because when developing a plan, this is a very aggressive plan, I think it's great. The community outreach is so vital and, and you know, clearly will make, a, make our decision making um, better at the end of the day, because our community has lots of great ideas. What I'm curious about is, what can happen sometimes uh, when we do a lot of community outreach is that popularity contests can pop up. And if the consultant says that we should be spending some money over here in, in A, and the community, because of its love for its parks, and particular parks in, in, at times, says we really want spending money in, in B, um, have you worked out how, because I, I worked out how you're gonna deal with that. And I think it's really, really important when we're doing community outreach to give the community a real sense of what's, of, of their, of their, of what's realistic and what their expectations, what can they expect from their input? Because um, if we tell them that they are, that how important their input is, which it is, and then we don't do what they necessarily, what, everything that they ask us to do, um, we've kind of set ourselves up for failure. So I'm just curious if, if how, that, how that will work if, if, they, if, those, if the consultant and then the community kind of butt heads over priorities. Uh, well, we, we do think about this in other similar projects. I mean, Measure M is kind of unique for parks, but with park master plans, something that we found successful, um, not to repeat this, but something we found successful uh, in getting folks uh, to give us feedback who normally wouldn't. So we're really hearing folks is to meet with members in their own community at their own meetings versus having huge uh, giant meetings with um, consultants and things like that, which we uh, will do some of that, but we also want to reach out to um, disadvantaged neighborhoods and neighborhoods that normally wouldn't reach out or wouldn't. I just met with somebody, uh, a group recently on Roseland who knew nothing about Roseland Community Park after 10 years of, of 
being out in the community asking folks about Roseland. So uh, we're really trying to st strategize. This is a statewide strategy from state parks to reach out, and we hope that those, as well as our transparency about timing of things and what we can and can't do, as well as providing the good information up front on what sort of funding we have for things and how long things take. Uh, I'm sure you all know how long things a master plan can take. So a new amenity in a, in a park that is not master plan that way will take longer. So hopefully providing some of that information as well as providing the consultants information from a city perspective uh, will help us collect the uh, group information that we can return to the, uh, to the Board of Community Services as well as the City Council uh, to make our recommendations for that based on what we're receiving. So we hopefully don't expect the consultants to be giving or uh, providing any feedback on that sense. We hope to combine it as one unit. And I will take your, uh, also your recommendation and your interest in having that equality as we develop, as the communications team develop our plan. Yeah. Council Member Sawyer, you know, I mean, that's part of the reason that that Deputy Director Santos has has this put together this program, is we want to understand clearly what the community in Santa Rosa wants to how they want to invest parks monies. We know that it's going to take us some time to understand those concerns and how they may overlap or how they may be uh, not the same, how they may be different. Uh, in the meantime, we want to be able to utilize the funds over the course of the first two years with things that we know are, are likely coming down the line, stuff, uh, projects that we know we can and should be investing in. And so that's why the program that you see is a, a one and two year proposal with the, the three through 10 year really being on the base, uh, well, being based off of this research of this community outreach program. And if we find that there are differing opinions, that's part of I mean, that's part of the good and the bad, right? We want to understand what all the different components are, and then it's up to us to collectively develop a prioritization on how we utilize that. $1.9 million is a great, great fund for the city, but it's still only $1.9 million, and it doesn't go, uh, it won't go uh, citywide. And so we do have to make some prioritizations, and this will help us create that level of strategy, even if there are some differing opinions. So I, I think that's why um, uh, Jen has put together this, this proposal that has these two distinct pieces to it. Thank you, and I appreciate that. And I think breaking it into the short term and the long term makes perfect sense, um, and we'll learn as we go as well. Thank you. Um, Mayor, if I could, uh, just I had additional information for Council Member Fleming's question. Um, at this point, uh, affordable housing projects are not exempt from our park impact fee program. And so they would be contributing uh, like every other uh, development and they would be then distributed into those four districts or quadrants uh, that we collect in um, to develop new parks or new amenities. Ms. Combs. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for what I consider to be an excellent presentation. So I think you did a really good job. I appreciate it. Um, I guess I'm following up on the equity question. Um, are, it doesn't look like we're prioritizing by area that is underparked, and so I'm interested in that. Um, attached to that is sort of the detailed question of are we using the half mile walk to the park or the quarter mile walk to the park. Um, some groups nationally recommend one number over the other and I'm wondering uh, where you're falling on that. Great, and um, we will definitely take a look at the under parked areas. We, we know and identify where those are and we absolutely intend to visit those neighborhoods in a variety of different ways. Um, and then, um, I'm sorry, can you repeat your question again? It, it was second about one. whether we were using the quarter mile walk oh, to the yes, park I'm so or sorry. the half mile walk to the park. We, we do uh, tend to start our 
analysis and where the general plan's recommendations are for a half mile for neighborhood parks and a mile for uh, our community parks. Uh, but we realize that those are just numbers in a plan. We really do reach out uh, as far as we can, usually in a community park like this, it's quadrant wide. So we're looking at nine to 10,000 mailers every time we meet with the community for a community park. So we really go way above and beyond to try to make sure we're including as many folks as possible. And we obviously with a citywide initiative like this, we would uh, be looking at a huge strategy for making sure we're including folks uh, citywide and on an equal basis per quadrant and per district. Will you actually go in a park and ask people in a park? Yes, some of the, um, you and know. That, that's a little biased because it's a yeah. person who could get to the park. <laughs> but go ahead. No, I, I appreciate it. We, you know, I love what we do and part of what we do is coming up with these really fun ideas of how to engage the community and we have been thinking of things uh, like um, an active participation in yoga or something like that where we can bring people to the park to remind them of the resource they have in their community and ask those uh, really pointed questions about the measure. Um, and again, it's, it's for me, it's, it's a great opportunity to get this outreach uh, with this amazing team we put together. Uh, because it's, um, it's the information we've been really been needing in the city for quite a while. Okay. And in, in the old days, and I don't know if we're still doing this or not, we included some school fields in our list of p available parks. Is there a plan to uh, coordinate with school boards? I can remember a number of years ago driving around and taking photos of the locked school fields that we were counting as park of accessible parks, but I think that may have changed. We, we do still have some school parks. Uh, they haven't been as successful as maybe they had been originally intended in the old days, <laughs> uh, but we do, uh, that is on our uh, our list already to engage with the, the schools we have in the in the city, citywide, as well, as well as parent leadership groups and groups like that. Thank you, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing from uh, the soccer community who I suspect is here to talk to us about that. Any other questions from council? I've got a couple here. Um, how are, you, you talked in about the uh, different quadrants and the other sources of funding. How does the downtown fit within a quadrant and approach since there's three different districts comprising over downtown, how does that work? Right, the, the, qu the quadrants for park development inf impact fees, uh, if you think about Highway 101 as a line and then Highway 12 as another line. So most of downtown, uh, maybe not Railroad Square, but downtown falls into quadrant three. Uh, the northeast quadrant. And so we've got a little mix of all the quadrants happening downtown depending over that highway drops. Okay. Sure. And so um, does Bennett Valley Golf Course fit into the, the ability to access any of these funds for some of the challenges that with deferred maintenance that we have there? Yes, they do. And I, have, I hear from them regularly, but yes, absolutely that uh, the community group that uses Bennett Valley Golf Course will have the opportunity. That's something we initially thought of is going to the groups that already engage in recreational activities with the city already. So it's an, it's an easy place for us to start and get them involved in there. It is part of the quadrant. Okay, and then as the groups in the process, and I really, um, I'm very appreciative of the public process that Rec and Park did with Coffee Park. And what I really appreciated uh, having been at several of those community meetings, then when we did the park master plan here, some comments were made that, you know, I don't like everything here, but I love the process because unless you can find that magic plan that everyone loves, I've yet to see one of those. So I do appreciate more opportunities. We have people to give us to give feedback and I hope many or if not most, hopefully all members of the community recognize we're not gonna be able to please everyone with whatever you come up with. Um, so in light of that, there's seven different bullet points on the attachment that is the guideline. So in the conversations, are you saying we're, we, we wanna at least touch all of the bullet points or we're gonna focus on a couple of the bullet points? How, how do you see managing that conversation? I think, well, what we've done initially with the team thus far is talk about that. How can we find out some initial information? And that's an easy place for us to start is trying to understand where does the community fall with those items? Is there something that is rising to the top? Is there something that is more important than others? We have obviously our anecdotal information from uh, our groups that we hear from all the time, uh, but we really 
we'll probably start that with a, an initial um, survey with additional questions as well as some information because we really don't want people to take the survey without hearing the information that you've heard tonight, at least some of that, so they can really provide us with meaningful feedback and not just a random selection. So we really want to get that out there first, just as a first touch base and see what is important to the community and then drill down a little farther. And so, then, Jason, this may be more a uh, question for you. Just with the, the recent reorganization of the recreation parks, where we have two different portfolios, so I would imagine both portfolio staff will be working together versus just your portfolio versus... That, that's versus, correct. Okay. Um, while Jen will be leading the, the effort to establish and manage the uh, expenditure plan for Measure M, um, she'll be working and coordinating with recreation uh, specifically as well as the maintenance team in an effort to ensure that all of the input is placed into the prioritization program. Great, thank you for that. Okay, we have several cards on this item. First up would be John Quinn, followed by Rochelle Cooley. Cooley. For taking this matter. There you go. Am I turned on? You're good now. Thank you for uh, undertaking this evaluation of our parks. Um, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council Member. I'd like to acknowledge some of the soccer community that's here. I am president of Santa Rosa Youth Soccer League. We represent thousands of families in this community. And one of the things that I wanted to make you aware of is we are underfielded for our soccer fields for our, these programs that we use to serve our youth. Um, in the 90s, people looked out and said, you know, we're underfielded, and they, they worked over a period of years to start building place to play out. Well, you know, that was built out in the first decade of, of this century, and the population has grown significantly since the 90s, and there have been no other kind of active recreation developments that I'm aware of in the city. Uh, so I think, you know, we're getting further and further behind every year. Uh, to solve the needs for active recreation in this area, you really need lighted all-weather fields in that portfolio because, you know, the, the kids in this community don't stop when it starts raining. They want a place they can, can recreate in the winter months here. And um, as you were well aware, in the worst times of the year, it gets dark at 440. And so if you got a kid who gets out of school and can make it to a practice or some gathering at four o'clock, doesn't give you much time for outdoor recreation. So I would say, you know, you've got to have that combination of lighted and all weather fields uh, and lighted all weather fields to meet the needs of the community. And, you know, this is not unique to soccer. There's other sports that would like some access to these sorts of facilities as well. Um, they're, they're major expenditures. They take a lot of time to plan and develop and build. But, you know, time's a waste, and we've recognized this problem for the last 20 years, and as a community, we haven't done anything about it. Our communities to the north in, in uh, Windsor and Healdsburg have done something about it. Roanoke Park has done something about it. Uh, Petaluma has done something about it. In Petaluma, you know, they're between a they're like a third the size of Santa Rosa, and they have four lighted all-weather soccer fields. We have zero in this community. Um, you know, Roanoke Park has got some. Uh, Windsor's got lighted fields, and, and I believe Healdsburg now has lighted all-weather fields. So we are not serving our community well when we don't do something to address the needs of youth that need active recreation. Thank you. Thank you. Rochelle Cool, followed by Linda Pru. Hi, my name is Rochelle, and I'm here to support soccer as well. Um, I was here in 2000, and uh, in front of all of whoever was at the podiums there, and we voted for Place to Play. I'm here to say that Place to Play is still not finished. It's been 20 years. My kids are all done and out of there now, and new kids are here. And I'm just wanting to say that that park, I know it's in a quadrant and I understand that part, but it's a useful park 
It's a different kind of park. It's not a community neighborhood park. It is a park for everybody. I myself, at 62, still play soccer and play there in the summer for a tournament. So it, it's useful for the community. It, it needs to be finished. It needs to be supported. Um, we travel a lot outside of the area to do our soccer tournaments. I'd love to just be here and not have to do that and have people, all of the people that we play against want to come to the wine country and, you know, we don't have any place for them to play. So we go to Sacramento and the South Bay and we go to every place else but here. We should have that kind of money, that kind of hotel tax here, that kind of money that we spend elsewhere should be here. And that goes for the kids, the kids' families, because I was one of the parents. We go everywhere and we want to go everywhere and we don't spend that money here. So um, I'm gonna give my time up to my new friend here. Okay. Hello, my name is Isaac Castillo. We would like to let the city council know that soccer in the United States is booming and is here to stay here in Santa Rosa since Joe Beluzzo started with 600 boys in 1970s. It has now grown to over 4,000 youth players spread across five soccer clubs and many more uh, recreational organizations. The city rose to occasions building six soccer fields at Place to Play in the 2000s, but it's time to finish the other two fields, even like them, like them like other cities in the country, have instead of renting lighted fields from local high schools, which is extremely difficult to do, or traveling down to Petaluma, Santa Rosa youth adults alike deserve all weather fields with lights like smaller towns that than Santa Rosa already have, or like city of Sonoma, who has agreed to fund with Measure, yeah, Measure M. A great solution would be turf, Galvin, and uh, lights, since they uh, already have lighted tennis and softball fields. Hotels like La Quinta, poisoned to be uh, finished, poised to be finished, next year would be a position to substantially increase bed tax. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Linda Pru, followed by Athea Hensel. Good evening, uh, I'm here representing the Southeast Greenway campaign this evening. And I'm really proud to say that during 2018, Southeast Greenway campaign volunteers worked tirelessly to help pass Measure M to support the parks that we love. We canvassed, we distributed signs and staffed phone banks. And so tonight we're really pleased that the council is considering a plan to use these funds. And we wanna thank Jen and the Parks Division staff for preparing this excellent plan. As you know, in July, the City Council approved the General Plan Amendment EIR and rezoning plan for the Southeast Greenway. Now we're entering a whole new chapter of this project, appraisal, negotiations, and fundraising just to acquire the property. But once the property is in hand, our community will have a great opportunity to plan and to develop this 47-acre greenway, which addresses several of the goals that Measure M was designed to meet, creating parks, trails, bikeways, public art, and recreation. Planning and developing those trails to connect to schools, community spaces, and other regional trails. Interestingly, there's an opportunity to decrease fire risk through starting with intelligent design and management, and then finally improving the trails along the three creeks that flow through the property, protecting natural habitat and water quality. So we're excited uh, about these possibilities of the future. As a well-established community group, the Southeast Greenway campaign would like to take part in the community outreach and engagement process to plan for the long-term use of Measure M funds. We look forward to working with the city and the larger community to envision and to realize a really positive future for Santa Rosa City Parks. Thank you. Thank you. Thea Hensel. 
Good evening, Mayor Schwedhelm and council members. My name is Thea Hensel. I live at 1354 Yalupa Avenue in Santa Rosa. Linda just mentioned some aspects and attributes of the Greenway, and for many of you, you've seen us following this process for years. We will continue to fundraise for this ongoing planning and development portion of this particular project, and we fully anticipate the ability to utilize Measure M funds along with the many planned projects that are already lined up in the queue, definitely honoring equity. The Rec and Park Department was a different entity when Measure M was drafted. Since that time, the department has been folded into public works and transportation. I have to assume this was seen as a cost-effective measure, which means consolidation of services. Questions arise from this consolidation. How is the public assured that Measure M funds will be used for parks initiatives in today's proposal? particularly if there are, is an overlapping of services. Will Measure M dollars be replacing some items that were prior expenditures? It was interesting to see that CBD for Courthouse Square talked about those above and beyond existing budget items and the additional dollars, something to consider. Will there be a clearly delineated Parks and Rec budget is a question since we hadn't anticipated this consolidation a few years ago when we worked on this measure. This plan holds the potential to be visionary, and while it outlines catch-up of deferred maintenance, which is badly needed, I hope that visions and projects can move along in tandem. We love our parks, and we want to be sure that $1.9 million will be used for items outlined in this plan and much more. Thank you. Thank you, Theo. Isaac, did you want to make any other comments, or are you good with? You good? Great. All right. Those are all the cards we have here. Uh, any additional questions from council? Yeah, I, I, I would, Mayor, and, I would, and thank you, Isaac, for uh, speaking to us. It takes courage to get up there and, and make comments. Uh, but I, I would have questions about soccer uh, fields and where I th it seems like we're lagging behind. This is not the first time I've heard that we lack fields out there, not just for kids, but even for adults. Uh, you know, we're looking at a at a sport, an international sport that's really, really increased in popularity. And I'd hate to see us falling behind. I think that we're missing some big opportunities in not pursuing some uh, opportunities to really uh, enhance the number of fields that we have and the conditions of the fields that we have. So. Uh, I hope that we're paying attention to that and, we, and that is included in our plan and outreach. I'm sure during your outreach process, you'll hear a lot more about it. So please uh, pay attention to that as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, soccer holds a special place in my heart. So I absolutely will be uh, working with the groups, all the recreational groups that we have, especially soccer. And we have a really great opportunity with a place to play uh, to complete that. So I'd ask the council if, if you have questions for staff, because what I would entertain is if you want to make a motion, get a second, and then if we want to give any specific other directions regarding the attachment. So do you have any questions for staff? No, just a comment. So I'll Do you have any questions? Okay. This is your item, Mr. Tibbs. Would you like to make a motion, and we'll get a second, and then we'll have any uh, remaining comments? Sounds good. So I'll move a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Rosa, approving the parks measure initial and long-term priority plan and waive for the reading of the text. So we have a motion by Mr. Tibbetts and a second by Mr. Oliver. So let's start on this side. What other comments or further direction would you like to give staff? Mr. Yeah, Tibbetts? I was going to save my comments until a later date because when I was looking at the um, priorities plan, I do appreciate that, that the priorities are clearly with strengthening and enhancing the parks that we have. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I talk to in this community that appreciate the parks that we have that were funded by a development project, but that development project did not carry that park. Uh, to its full potential. And I think we have an obligation to all the neighbors throughout the neighborhoods in the city to make that the priority. Um, but I also understand and recognize that we're deficient in many other areas. We have an amazing campaign championed by a lot of dedicated people in the community who no doubt have expectations uh, that this council will support a final product of the Greenway. Similarly, all the young people in the audience and all the soccer players throughout the city who want to see enhanced fields and, and more fields to serve a greater number of players 
And on that latter point, I just wanted to ask you or put on your radar, Jen, is that when you're meeting with these community groups is to meet with Santa Rosa City Schools because I had a meeting with the superintendent and the uh, president of the school board to dis with a local soccer group that has a lot of cross-pollination with uh, Santa Rosa United. And there's a lot of underutilization of their fields. And when we look at the cost of putting in a new uh, synthetic field, uh, even though that's probably cheaper than grass in the long term, I think that if we want to really maximize the dollar and deliver soccer fields to the community, we need to work better with the schools to um, maximize both our output and utilization of those fields. So I hope you'll speak with them. I'll be asking about it when this item comes back to the council in the future. Thank you. Ms. Fleming? Thank you. And once again, thank you to you and your staff for an, a great presentation. I want to thank the voters of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County for supporting this measure. And I want to note that it is a regressive tax. That means that people who are lower income pay a higher percentage of their income towards this tax in particular. And with an eye towards the public commons, that's a philosophy that I hold that applies to schools, to our libraries, to our parks, and to, in general, our public spaces, that we make sure that they're accessible to each and every resident, wealthy and, and not wealthy, and that especially keeping in mind that this is a measure that is funded by the least amongst us, and that it's a priority to make sure that we repair parks that were damaged in the fires, but it's also a priority to make sure that we take care of our, the least amongst us, and it, and it pays us dividends. We know that in libraries, and we also know that in schools, and, and of course in parks, that where we have these services, we end up saving a lot of money down the road. And I'm sure that's why you do it, and I'm sure that's why everybody's here, because we love our common spaces. So just want to put a plug in for, for equity and for the civil rights that, that it brings when we do think these things in a mindful way. Okay, thank you. Ms. Gomes, any comments? Mr. Oliveres, any additional comments? Yeah, and, and I apologize. I started with a question, but I ended up with a statement the last time, but, uh, but I'll continue with statements. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, recreation and parks uh, is one of those things that uh, touches many, many uh, regional initiatives, whether it's uh, uh, Cradle to Career, Port of Sonoma, Health Action, uh, our violence prevention partnership that touches so many things. You look at the benefits, and I'm preaching to the choir because you know this, but I, I just want to reiterate that, that this is so important. Uh, the benefits that a community can get from our parks and recreation are tremendous uh, from so many different aspects. So uh, I, I fully, fully support this, and I hope that we uh, do continue to engage our community to really get the information that we need uh, to continue making progress in these areas. So thank you. Mr. Sawyer, any comments? Mr. Vice Mayor. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to just also appreciate that we're not having this conversation in a vacuum. I know it was mentioned what other cities have, and I think it's important for us to, to be comparable. Uh, but we also know, for example, that the Fair Board is looking at their own proposal to put in a youth soccer facility that has multiple all-weather lighted uh, uh soccer fields as well. So while not Santa Rosa city land, it is still going to end up being, if they move forward with that proposal, within the city limits. So I don't want us to lose sight of what other folks around us are doing as well and how we play into that as a larger entity. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with the direction that you've laid out for us to go at least initially, and I'm really curious to see what the uh, consultant will end up bringing back to us in terms of deferred maintenance and in terms of uh, prioritization, particularly after talking to the community. It, it's not sexy to say that you're gonna fund operations and maintenance, but part of why we find ourselves where we are is because we do have this habit of putting forward grants and money into capital expenditures to build something and then not have the budget to be able to maintain it long term. And I think Council Member Tibbetts is right when he talks about making sure that we're keeping the promise to neighborhoods around Santa Rosa by keeping those parks up to date and keeping them well maintained and usable for folks, not just moving on to the new shiny object that is gonna sound great when we do our community input meetings. Um, it, particularly understanding that most grants that we can go after 
aren't going to fund operations and maintenance. This is a funding source that we can particularly use to catch up on that deferred maintenance and use that as leverage to pull in additional grants to build something new. So uh, those will be my comments going forward and I look forward to seeing what the consultant comes up with. Uh, but for now, thank you for this proposal. Yeah, I also want to um, thank you for this presentation. I also want to recognize Dan Condren, who actually will be sitting on, he was appointed by the Board of Supervisors on the measure of oversight. And I recognize, Dan, you won't have input as to what we do, but I think it's very important, I appreciate you being here to hear these comments, because you'll be in meetings that we won't be in, and you can share what you've heard here, what you've heard from us, and the comments from our staff, so I appreciate you being here. Um, my interest, I, I love the community input, but uh, I want to use, go back to the uh, pavement condition index discussion we had earlier. So if PCI right now is Santa Rosa is 61, Bay Area want to get to 75, that's a nice goal. I would like to see that with our parks. You know, I want Santa Rosa to be known. They've got the cleanest parks, the prettiest parks. We want, I want to be known for having parks that, you know, were the standard of excellence. What that means, because it's not as clear as a PCI, but that's where, you know, it goes into some of the other comments that my colleagues have made about the maintenance. How do we get it so that we're not scrambling? How do we get it so that everyone loves going to our parks and other community members will be saying, you have to go to Santa Rosa because what they're doing is the right thing. So I, I, I'd, I'd much rather do a fewer things well than expand our resources. Yeah, we have parks all over, but we're not, we don't have the ability to maintain and have it rock star status. So that's the direction that I would like to go and I think it fits within our attachment A in that. So with that, we have our comments, we have a motion, we've got a second, your votes please. Not surprisingly, that passes 7-0. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and providing your input, and this is not the last opportunity for input. Mr. Nutt, are you staying in the chair for 16.1? I have a feeling uh, my boss will be coming down shortly, but if you'd like me to go ahead and introduce while Please. he's working his way down. Um, item 16.1 is a public hearing, uh, TEFRA public hearing for a tax-exempt bond issuance by the California Municipal Finance Authority in an amount not to exceed 66 million for Quail Run Apartments at 1018 Bellevue Avenue. Frank Kazimoff, Program Specialist, and Steve Malikian, Jones Hall presenting. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Mayor and uh, council members. This TEFRA public hearing is for the for future issuance of tax exempt bonds in an amount not to exceed $66 million for acquisition and rehabilitation of quail run apartments located at 1018 Bellevue Avenue. The issuance of tax exempt private equity revenue bonds must be approved by the governing body in whose jurisdiction the project is located following a public hearing. This is often referred to as a TEFRA public hearing because it is held in accordance with the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act or TEFRA of 1982 as set forth in the Internal Revenue Code. Quail Run is an existing affordable housing development with 200 multifamily rental units on 10 acres. The site is comprised of 10, two and three story residential walk-up buildings and one community building on two parcels. There is a mix of one, two, three and four bedroom uh, units. The apartments were constructed in 1999. On this uh, aerial, the uh, site is outlined in blue. It's a triangular shaped parcel uh, south of Bellevue and a rectangular shaped parcel north of Bellevue Avenue. Uh, that is the southern tip of San Rosa on the east side of Highway 101. And this is the same site from a bird's eye perspective. The city's involvement with Quail Run dates back to 1997 with the issuance of a tax exempt bond in the amount of $12,850,000 for site acquisition and construction of the project, which was completed in 1999. There were additional funding sources for that project as well. In 2011, the, the owner paid off the bonds with a new loan, but the bond regulatory agreement continued to restrict the income and rents for 80 units at 60% of area median income, or AMI, 
until 2016 when it expired. In 2014, a couple years before that time, the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Rosa provided a loan in the amount of $350,000 for Eden Housing, a nonprofit affordable housing developer, to acquire the general partnership interest in the property. Eden also became the property manager. The Housing Authority's loan started a new 55-year regulatory period with the Housing Authority's uh, terms. Under this regulatory agreement, uh, 199 of the units are restricted at 60% of AMI, and there's one unrestricted unit for the resident manager. Rents are calculated at 30% of income level and adjusted for household size and tenant paid utilities. This regulatory agreement remains in place through this process. Eden Housing is recapitalizing the property to finance the $88 million acquisition and rehabilitation of Quail Run Apartments. The rehabilitation portion of the project is approximately $20 million of the total cost, with much of the other costs associated with the acquisition by a new owner, a limited partnership. Eden will remain with the new ownership structure as the general manager and the property manager through its affiliates. The primary funding sources for this project include the tax-exempt bond, which is the subject of this public hearing, as well as a new allocation of tax credits. The maximum bond issue will be $66 million. Eden has selected the California Municipal Finance Authority, or CMFA, to be the bond issuer. CMFA is a joint powers authority authorized to issue the bonds, and the city has been a member of the Joint Powers Authority since 2010. The primary purpose of the recapitalization is to rehabilitate the 20-year-old property. Major work will include replacing the, existing, the exterior stair towers, achieving compliance with accessibility standards in 5% of the units as required, as well as in the path of travel community buildings and common areas, such as the pool and playground. Also includes installing new roofs, waterproofing balconies, uh, replacing old and inefficient hot water heaters, refrigerators and dishwashers with new energy and water efficient units, installing energy efficient LED lighting, replacing the air conditioning, air conditioning units in the community building. As budget allows, the project will also include in-unit improvements such as replacing countertops and cabinets, replacing flooring, windows, siding, and doors, and hardware. The tax-exempt revenue bonds are a major part of the total financing for the acquisition and rehabilitation of this affordable housing development. An issuance of the tax-exempt bonds will not have a fiscal impact on the city or the general fund. All the financial costs of repayment of the bonds are the responsibility of the borrower. And lastly, CMFA shares 25% of its issuance fee with the host jurisdiction. The city share is estimated to be $18,000. It is recommended by the Housing and Community Services, Services Department that the City Council, by resolution one, approve the issuance by California Municipal Finance Authority of tax-exempt multifamily housing revenue bonds in an amount not to exceed $66 million to finance the acquisition, rehabilitation, and associated costs of Quail Run Apartments, 1018 Bellevue Avenue, and two, to appropriate the, appropriate the city share of CMFA's issuance fee, approximately $18,000, to fund 2295, the Housing Compliance Fund, for affordable housing purposes. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'd like to, uh, as, as mentioned before, Steve Malikian from Jones Hall, the city's bond council is here with us. Also, Travis Cooper, a financial advisor with the California Municipal Finance Authority is here. And Andy Madera, Eden's senior vice president of real estate development is also here. And the latter two, I believe, have cards to speak under the public uh, hearing as well. Thank you. Great, thank you for the presentation. Council, uh, questions? Mr. Tibbetts. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just to be clear, we, when we get these bonds issued, we're the ones uh, that are carrying the note, is that correct? We're the ones incurring the debt liabilities? 
No, we're not uh, incurring it. We're actually, a con we're, we're actually not issuing in this case. When we do issue, we're a conduit and we, we don't have any responsibility for the paying back of those loans. Anyway, I'd like to actually invite Mr. Malicki yeah. down. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. I'm Steve Malikian with Jones Hall, the city's bond council. And I think there's really two questions there. The first is, in this instance, the city is only holding the public hearing, which is required by the tax code. The actual issuer of the bonds will be the California Municipal Finance Authority. However, when the city does issue these kinds of bonds, the city has no financial responsibility for them. They're, they're the obligation of the borrower. Uh, in other words, the multifamily project owner. They have no financial impact on the city, uh, city's general fund or any other fund of the city. Okay, and Mr. Kazimov, is this kind of the standard operating procedure for these affordable housing developments is to basically let the depreciation run, not really do much maintenance set-asides, and then we get these entities to issue debt to repay over the course of the next 20 years? Well, I'm just looking at the 66 million kind of going, you know, that's a, that's a heck of a lot of uh, repairs, how much was set aside from the project, while recognizing that the affordable housing is not exactly a, a lucrative business to be doing maintenance set asides. It's a good, it's a good question. Um, the typical initial period for financing and, and for affordable housing is about 15 years. And at the end of that, it's a tax credit period. There's an eligibility to basically re, redo it, re-syndicate and, and have recapitalized the project uh, to capture these funds to go on to the next, the next term of it. So they do have, and they, they typically do have a budget, a capital reserve to do, you know, standard upkeep. Um, and a lot of times after 15, 20 years, there's major upkeep that goes above and beyond that, and so this is a, this is a process that will we have seen and will continue to see uh, in the future with, with projects that get to be 15 years or, or older. Okay, thanks, Ms. Gomes. Thank you. This one is a little unusual. I think I've seen conduit bonds here before, but not one where we're kind of not really involved except for providing the hearing. So this is different from the conduit bond. Uh, yes, it is. Um, the city's role really is just to uh, uh, consider, hold the public hearing, consider the resolution, and then the city in effect steps away. This, the housing authority still has the regulatory agreement on the property which I believe goes for another 50 years. And so the, uh, the housing authority will continue to monitor the property, but with respect to the bonds, the city's involvement really is only tonight. So if, if I'm reading the resolution correctly, section two and section four pretty clearly state we have no obligation if there should be a problem with the bond repayment. That is absolutely correct. Okay. Um, and following up, does this restart the 55 year obligation? Well, there will be a, a different, it won't restart the housing authority's obligation. That started in 2014 for 55 years, but there will be a new uh, bond regulatory obligation as well as a tax credit regulatory obligation, both of which would run 55 years. Okay, so it still would have to have some level of affordability for 55 years from this point, even though we're not specifically saying it here because it's only been like five years since the last time. Right, it, we'll have a 50 year overlap and then theirs will carry forward it, from, from when they, they started. And yeah. can you explain the $18,000 housing compliance fund for me? Well, that's a place where we're recommending, so CMFA gets an issuance fee to, to defray their cost and to, um, and, and you know, for their costs, but they share some of that with the city or the host jurisdiction. Because we're doing this. Right, and so that money comes to you, you can put it wherever you want. We're suggesting that it goes into affordable housing and in particular this, um, this particular fund. The compliance fund. 
And if you and I guess what I'm asking is, what's the compliance fund? I just don't know what that is. Okay, we'll invite uh, Megan Bassinger, the Housing and Community Services Manager, to Thank explain you that. Thank you so much. It sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Megan Bassinger, Housing and Community Services Manager. The um, Housing Authority's Compliance Fund is an administrative fund that we use to staff the Santa Rosa Housing Trust, and this is the group of employees that performs compliance monitoring on the city's affordable housing portfolio. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, uh, no, Mr. Short. This is a... Uh, public hearing, so I will open the public hearing. I do have three cards. You don't have to fill out a court, uh, card, but we'll go through these first. Uh, first up is Mr. George Uberti, followed by Travis Cooper. Right, um, what I see is that in 1997, uh, $12.85 million built this entire complex of 200 units. Now you adjust that for inflation and it's 20 million, right? Now 20 million is the proportion of this 66 million that goes to rehabilitation. I believe we all saw the list of rehabilitation. We're replacing water heaters, waterproofing decks. You can build an entire complex for 20 million. So 20 million for rehabilitation costs unaccounted for. And then we still got what, another 46 million? That goes where, right? Uh, now this is, you know, I understand what you guys are gonna be out $18,000 in the city of Santa Rosa, you're just holding a hearing, I get that, right? But this is $66 million that we're exempting from taxes, right, of any kind, not gonna benefit the general public at all, right? Uh, in fact, it says, specifically here uh, in the agenda item that you uh, provided for 60.1, adopt a resolution approving the issuance of bonds by the CMFA for the benefit of Santa Rosa Quail Run LP, right? So a private company is gonna benefit from this. Public's not gonna benefit from it. No tax revenue generated off it, right? 200 units that are already there, Right, $66 million, I mean, I mean, it's an $88 million project altogether, right? So that's, if you break that down by 200, that's $440,000 a unit. Right now, if we're finding a way to get $440,000 uh, for the cause of affordable housing, we can just build it from the ground up. I mean, 20 million gets you 200 units, doesn't it? I mean, it did in 1997, it can do it right now. Right, this will add zero units. It'll add nothing. I mean, if you haven't got it yet, my voice in this public hearing is for strongly disagree. Right, this is not the best way for the public in general to use affordable housing funds. Right, this is a waste of money. I mean, just the 20 million that's out of this 88 total project cost, just that already that's set aside for rehabilitation, there is absolutely no way that it can be accounted for by rehabilitation costs. I question the Santa Rosa Public Housing Authority's ability to monitor this competently, because I don't, I don't see 20 million going to rehabilitation. It just doesn't happen with the rehabilitations that are listed here, right? You can't waterproof $20 million worth of decks. It's not gonna happen, all right? Uh, besides, and then we still have another $40 million to account for. This is ridiculous, right? I mean, this is an absolutely ridiculous proposition. An eighth grader could do the math and tell you that, all right? Um, for what I can put forward at this public hearing, right? Absolutely not. I mean, if there's anything that we can do to stop this, we should do it. Let's build houses, please. Thank you. Travis Cooper followed by Andy Madeira. <clears throat> Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, my name is Travis Cooper. I'm with the California Municipal Finance Authority. I just want to introduce myself and thank you for holding the public hearing and all the work that um, Frank has put forth to, to get this on the agenda um, and to just address a few of the questions um, by the previous speaker. The thing to remember with this public hearing is, and the loan and the debt itself is this is essentially a private loan between the developer and the bank. Um, the TEFRA requires that a public hearing be held um, and that the city council approve um, the CMFA as an issuer. But in, at the end of the day, it's tax exempt debt. It's a private, a private um, loan between the bank 
and, and, and the developer. Um, so here, happy to answer any questions if you have them. Great, thank you. Andy Madeira. Uh, good evening, council members. Uh, again, my name is Andy Madeira. Uh, I'm Senior Vice President for Real Estate Development at Eden Housing. We're a nonprofit that is 51 years old this year. Um, we acquired uh, Quail Run uh, to preserve it um, so that it maintained uh, as an affordable housing asset for this community. Uh, when we retain, uh, acquired it four years ago, uh, we knew that it was going to require uh, a substantial rehab and recapitalization. And so since we acquired it, um, we basically have been uh, accumulating funds um, from the operation of the property itself. Uh, we have been uh, investing into the property in the five years that we've owned it in order to address immediate needs. And so if any of you have been out there, we've actually done a significant amount of work um, to address immediate um, health and safety issues that were occurring at the property, particularly in regard to um, uh, in regard to the stairs where there was substantial uh, damage due to the weather. Um, the way the, the plan now is to do a substantial uh, rehab of the property uh, to really preserve it again um, for affordability for the long term. This is uh, generally speaking, it is a low income working population. Um, at the site, uh, in addition to the housing that we provide, we also um, provide services as well. So our budget um, as part of the rehab will actually allow us to have a staff member on site uh, to uh, work with the residents and to work with the resources that are available in this community to make sure that uh, we connect uh, residents who desire services um, with those that are available. Some of the confusion I think about all of these, um, these uh, rehabs is that we are actually better off when we maximize the size of the uh, tax exempt bond because the bond is tied to um, the calculation of a federal low income housing tax credit. So the larger the, non, the, uh, the tax exempt bond, the more subsidy we're actually bringing in from the federal government. Uh, it's not coming from uh, this community, it's really coming from, again, um, from the low income housing tax credit that is the primary mechanism, mechanism by which we develop affordable housing these days. At the end of the day, when we uh, actually finish construction and pay down the bonds, the permanent debt um, that will be supporting the outstanding bonds will be about 25 million. That 25 million will allow us to actually leverage an additional 30 million, roughly, uh, in uh, tax credit equity that comes from uh, an investor. Uh, that investor is typically a bank that is investing really for purely for Community Reinvestment Act purposes um, and are really receiving very low return um, on their investment. Okay. We are in the process right now of um, negotiating uh, with uh, investors to get the best deal um, for this property. Um, right, if you could wrap and, up your comments, please. Yeah, and again, I'm happy to explain any more of the uh, sort of esoteric nature of this uh, property, but the goal is really to preserve it as an asset um, for the residents Great. here. Thank you. Those are all the cards. Uh, you need to have, fill out a card if you'd like to address the council on this item. Please, if you could please identify yourself and step up to that one, please. Yeah. Identify yourself and address the council. Hi, I'm, I'm Pat Mitchell. Is this public open? To, I'm, are we addressing an issue on the agenda or is this open? Yes, no, no, this is on the item, item 16.1 about okay. the Okay, all Tefra right, I'll hearing. speak later then, sorry. All right. Would anyone like to address the council on this item? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Bring back to council, do you have any additional questions for anyone, Ms. Fleming? I do have a question about the 18,000 in city match. It says that it won't impact our general fund, but that we are, it seems that we don't, um, we aren't on the hook for the bond. We don't really have a say. We have to hold the hearing and we have to pony up $18,000. No, no, actually. Um, or they're paying us 18,000. They're, they're providing, you're giving us 18,000. That seems like a better deal. Just want to clarify. Okay. Any other questions? Ms. Combs, you have this item. Thank you, and I appreciate 
uh, you're bringing this forward to us. This is an opportunity for us to preserve affordable housing in our community. The three P's for uh, affordability are protect tenants, preserve existing affordable structures, and then produce new housing. So uh, we're doing a good job uh, in this point in pres helping preserve affordable housing without using any of our own city dollars. And in fact, it brings in a little bit, uh, not for nothing. Uh, so thank you very much, and I'll, I'll move the resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa approving the issuance of qualified residential rental project bonds in an amount not to exceed 66 million by the California Municipal Finance Authority in accordance with section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code and the Joint Exercise of Powers Agreement relating to said authority and wait for the reading of the text. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second by Mr. Oliveras. Any additional comments? Seeing none, your votes please. And that passes unanimously. Thank you for the presentation, Frank and Megan. Thank you very much. Right. Item 17.1, the response to the grand jury. Since I see our water director here, does council have any questions about that written correspondence? Seeing none, also the final map. Do we have any cards for item 18? And for another public comment and on agenda items, Pat Mitchell. I think the mic's turned off. There you go, we can hear okay. you now. All right, sorry, I lost, lost track of the agenda there. Um, okay, first of all, I wanna thank the Santa Rosa City for the, our grass got cut on, uh, on Lano. No one is in danger of uh, a collision there because they can't see because of the grass. Uh, that got cut a few days ago and I wanted to thank you for that. Uh, also wanted to remind you about the cypress trees on Walker Avenue, on Max Graff's uh, property, and uh, I, I sure hope you guys are planning on cutting them down. You do own that property. Uh, they are a fire hazard, potential fire hazard, and uh, kind of scary. All right, and the other reason I'm here, I, I hope you have a copy of these maps. There's two maps. The one, I'm not gonna be talking about the one uh, on mark, X marks the spot. You may have seen that one already. I'm talking, gonna talk about this one that shows the districts and the property that Santa Rosa City owns, Laguna Treatment Plant, and where else uh, could a compost facility go? Santa Rosa City owns the property in green on Lano Road. It may not show up green very well on your paper. Um, Regarding, I, I'm assuming you saw the Press Democrat today in the article on the proposed um, compost facility, and Greg is quoted as, uh, well, he, the statement is that his house is uh, several blocks away, but it's only 528 yards away uh, from the proposed uh, compost facility, and it's direct, his home is directly downwind. Um, and, uh, there's 61 plus residences that would be impacted on the Walker Lano Todd block. Um, it in, includes the um, middle lane. It's a one mile block, okay? One mile Walker, one mile Lano, and then Todd and middle lane, very short little sections. And these, there are 61 residences or more, hard to count. It's rural residential and there's houses behind houses, so can't always tell. Um, and uh, so I live on Walker Avenue and um, we're downwind from the proposed treatment facility. Reacting to this news, my neighbor Bill expressed it well. There will be a diminution and diminution in the value of our property. I am downwind of the proposed facility and the facility would make my house uninhabitable and worthless. The city of Santa Rosa would be, li um, be liable for the 
diminution, <laughs> sorry, I put in an extra vowel there, um, in value. It's a legal term and it would be tens of millions of dollars. All of Sebastopol would be impacted by heavy increase in truck traffic on Highway 16 and Highway 12. Gases escaping from compost emitted into the air are known to cause cancer. We have young children living on Walker. Are you thank, willing thank to you, risk Pat. their lives? Please find a different location. I know it's difficult, but it's possible and needs to be done. Thank, thank you. you. Um, George, you can st speak of items not on the agenda, but you can't talk about 17.2. We've already covered that. We just covered that. We just went through there. Okay, not seeing anything. Uh, we'll adjourn the meeting.